Justice Committee, and if you can do the needful with your electronic devices, any declarations of interest, financial or otherwise, related to today's business, now is the time to declare it. If not, then we shall proceed. There is um, some oral evidence sessions today, folks, and if you're content, we will report them by Hansard. Apologies are in from Gordon Dunn and Emma Rogan, and then we should be joined by uh, Linda Doug. Uh, Paul is here in the room, uh, Sinead, Rachel and Gemma via the Starleaf facility and you're all very welcome to the meeting. If the clerk can just advise of any delegated votes as per the relevant standing order, please. Uh, under standing order 1156, Gordon Dunn has delegated his vote to the chairman, Paul Given, and Emma Rogan has delegated her vote to the deputy chairperson, Linda Dillon. Okay, thank you, Christine. Draft minutes of the meeting then held on the 13th of May. If members are content that there is true reflection, then I shall sign them accordingly. Agreed. Okay, matters arising. Um, there's no uh, matters arising to cover. Uh, so agenda item four is the protection from stalking bill, the oral evidence session from victim support. So there's a, an updated summary of the key issues and proposed changes raised in the written evidence received on the protection from stalking bill. That's in the tabled pack. And that has also been added to the electronic bill folders. And members may wish to refer to that. So we have a representative uh, from Victim Support joining us via Starleaf. And a copy of that written submission is on pages 17 to 23, members of your meeting pack. So can I uh, formally welcome Louise Kennedy, the Policy and Communications Manager from Victim Support Northern Ireland. Uh, you're very welcome to the uh, meeting. Um, and we will record this by Hansard. We'll publish a transcript in due course. So Louise, I'm going to hand over to you if you want to give us an outline uh, just of uh, your submission and then we'll follow that up with some questions from members. Thank you Louise. Thank you Chair, just checking that everyone can hear me correctly. Yes, you're coming through loud and clear, thank you. Excellent, thank you very much. And thank you for giving victim support the opportunity to provide evidence on the stalking bill today. We're delighted to see the bill progress through the assembly as it has been a law literally years in the making at this point. Um, I'd like to start by providing a very brief snapshot of how stalking is currently being tackled from the perspective of victims. As you'll know, victim support is the lead agency supporting victims of crime in Northern Ireland. And there's an opt-out system that operates with the PSNI and ourselves. So when a victim of crime reports to police, that victim's details will automatically be passed on to us unless the victim has expressly opted out. So cons consequently, we support victims of all types of crime, and that does include victims of stalking. So in advance of today's evidence session, I spoke to, spoke to our support staff and indeed our independent sexual violence advocates, or ISVAs, this week, just so I could provide you with the most up-to-date lay of the land, as it were, um, with regards to stalking. And, and the main takeaways are as follows. So victims currently find cases of stalking hard to report and difficult to navigate properly through the criminal justice process. When reported, incidents are still being looked at in isolation, not as a collective pattern of behaviour. And that isn't helped by the fact that when victims report a new incident to police, this can be dealt with by a different team or a different person each time. So uh, one incident in isolation and without that broader context of the pattern of behaviour can often appear as minor to many um, agencies and agents or just not serious enough to investigate in and of itself. So consequently, agencies are just not seeing that bigger picture or recognising the seriousness of the behaviours in the whole. Uh, a lot of victims feel extremely worried that the pattern of minor but escalating behaviour being inflicted on them is a build up to something more serious, a more serious incident that could harm them. And victims report to us they, they feel they have no protection in cases like this, leaving them feeling vulnerable and at risk of more serious harm. Um, stalking online has also massively increased. There are simply now more avenues. Um, um, via online, and people feel more vulnerable to online stalking now than than, than most uh, now that most of the world has moved onto that virtual platform. Uh, in universities and in the workplace, um, for example, invites to lectures or training sessions can be sent out in a big group email, and an invite list is visible for all, and that's increasing the online stalking at universities and so forth. And finally, during COVID, victims have reported feeling much more vulnerable due to the stay-at-home messaging, and um, because therefore stalkers are almost certainly no where their victims are for the majority of the time. So that's a current, those are the current challenges that we're witnessing with the status quo and that we hope that this bill will actually overcome. 
I think it's important first and foremost to say that overall this is a good piece of legislation. It's a positive step that stalking is going to be explicitly named in law as a crime because that's going to help both victims of, of stalking and justice agencies to better recognise it and respond to it more effectively in a way that prioritises victim safety. Um, it's also positive that the bill is broad enough to include conduct that amounts to digitally assisted or cyber stalking. Um, the bill also moves us one step closer to the ratification of the Council of Europe Istanbul Convention, which is widely regarded as the gold standard for tackling all forms of violence against women. And it will go some way to meet recommendations that were made by the UN CEDAW Committee in its most recent examination of the UK in 2019. So in terms of the law's construction, we are supportive of this law and primary legislation more generally being gender neutral. Um, it's important to recognise stalking can happen to anyone, um, though it is disproportionately experienced by women and perpetrated by men. To our mind, having gender neutral law allows for applicability in all cases where stalking is taking place. Where the gender lens can come in then and should come in is in the training and in the guidance, which will assist police and legal practitioners to re recognise the different presentations of stalking when it comes to victims who are female, male, trans, heterosexual, LGBT. It is for the benefit of all victims, for example, for there to be a gender aware approach to training. Um, and we see this as part of a broader upskilling of relevant practitioners to recognise and understand the many nuances of stalking behaviours, including how they present depending on gender, um, and also, you know, the, there is nuance in training and guidance. It should foster an understanding of different types of stalking that exist and different types of stalker. And um, so as our written evidence has attested, you know, we do feel like there are a lot of positives in this bill as presented. You know, ultimately, victim support is of the view that the key to this law being a success will, in fact, be in its operationalisation. Um, we're aware that the committee is seeking to consult with Scottish support practitioners to hear their view on, on their stalking law, which resembles our own in many ways, and that the Susie Lamplet Trust, for example, are, get, are giving evidence in the English approach this afternoon. And that will be really useful in giving us an insight from a victim's perspective into how the law has already been operationalised elsewhere, what has worked, what hasn't worked. And we do look forward to hearing that evidence so that we can you know, obviously collectively make Northern Ireland's response to stalking the best it can be. In the meantime, I have a few points of victim support and I would like to add from our perspective. So uh, as was stressed during the debate and scrutiny of the Domestic Abuse Act, um, even the best crafted statutes can be worth little more than the paper they're written on if they're not rolled out effectively. And I think that's a sentiment that has been echoed by all agencies given evidence thus far and indeed from, from the committee, committee yourselves. Um, and there are some areas that we'd like to highlight today where work could be done to ensure that effectiveness. So first, we'd endorse the, um, the view of the PSNI that for this law to be operationalised effectively, it needs to be resourced adequately and it needs to include sufficient training for officers. To our mind, this is not just a new law. Um, like the Domestic Abuse and Civil Proceedings Act, it's a new way of doing things um, which will require a new mindset and in your approach from our criminal justice agencies. Um, and it's just not reasonable um, to expect that such a cultural change will happen of its own accord. Um, agencies such as police and prosecutors, they need to be given the resources, training and tools to be able to meet the challenge of tackling stalking. And that will inevitably lead to and uh, need to include resources to deal with the investigative burden, um, of course, of conduct crimes and ongoing training for, st um, for officers as stalking tactics and patterns shift and evolved with new technologies and new circumstances like the pandemic. Um, we'd also point out that victim confidence in the new law and the justice system more generally will require better communication with victims. And um, now this is not an issue that's just confined to stalking or this bill. Um, but as such victims are particularly vulnerable and constantly having to reassess their safety, we think it is particularly important to mention. So keeping victims informed and consulted about steps taken, such as arrest, release and bail, imposition of SPOs, conditions attached, they're all crucial so, they, so that victims can make decisions and take actions to safeguard themselves. Uh, we have a justice system that is very offender focused by its very nature and structure, and that can often be to victims' detriment. So it's important that agencies are deliberately and as a matter of policy communicating with victims effectively in a timely fashion. And that would include effective communication and consultation in the event that it's proposed that, for example, an SP will be shortened or amended. So finally, we, we would highlight several issues that the committee may also wish to consider. One, it may be useful to set up a stalking register, given the fact that some stalkers are, are serial perpetrators. Um, a register which has, the, has, has been flagged as, an, as, an, as a good idea by the likes of Paladin um, would be an invaluable preventative tool. Ultimately, most victims tell us that their main wish 
uh, from the justice system in addition to their own safety is for no one else to have to go through what they have and a stalking register may help make that wish a reality uh, number two better data will help us improve tailor and evolve our response to stalking so specific data collection around reportage of incidents and whether the law is being used and utilized adequately at each stage of that justice process would be useful in monitoring its, its success and finally, if we're truly to tackle um, those behaviours like stalking, domestic abuse and other crimes of, of that kind of intimate abusive nature, it's not enough for us only to react once they've happened. By that stage, the horse is well and truly bolted, unfortunately. So if we're serious about tackling stalking and preventing future perpetrators and victims being created, we need to educate people. And that means awareness raising campaigns, but it also means uh, standardised mandatory RSE education in all our schools for all age groups in an age appropriate way. And I, I know that this is not the domain of justice, but you know, justice is a bellwether of how effective we have been in our other efforts up the road preventatively. Um, and across, now across party departmental uh, violence against women's strategy, which has been flagged, may be one part of that solution. And it's something that, that victim support are in favour of and we'd like to see as soon as possible. And of course, you know, the work of the Gillen implementation team, which includes the rollout of the education and awareness raising recommendations, we hope will be a game changer in this regard. But if those initiatives fall short um, of teaching our citizens about relationships, respect, consent, healthy boundaries and resilience, then we are failing them and, and failing future generations to come. So I thank you for your time, Chair and members, and I'm happy to, of course, answer any questions you or the committee may have. Louise, thank you, and you've uh, given a very good overview for us, um, reassuring that um, you recognise the uh, legislation as a good piece of work, and obviously there's areas that we mm -hmm. will want to, to look at in some further detail. One of the areas um, that you have recommended is that the stalking register for serial perpetrators um, of stalking and abuse. Can you just elaborate on how you would see the, a kind of stalking register operating? Would, would it be akin to the kind of sex offender registration requirements? I suppose yeah, this is something that we would see um, as being similar in that regard. I suppose you know one of the differences is you know do you if you have a, a stalking register, would it only be applicable if someone had been, for example, convicted under the stalking legislation? And um, you know obviously there are always going to be um, presumption of innocence and defendants um, rights and, and the rights of victims to be balanced. But certainly you know we are we would hope that you know between with this legislation making stalking an explicit crime and having those protection orders and, and that entire regime of change with you know course of control and so forth all, all being part of that mix that we would have a more effective um, prosecution and conviction of, of perpetrators and, and that could be in that um, you know rolled out in that regard. That said you know uh, there is a, there is a question as to whether um, it's also valid that if someone is found to be a serial perpetrator of stalking has not yet been convicted, is there merit in in you know having an operational register of some kind? Now, you know I can't I do not have the, perhaps the, the skill set to go into that in more detail like the for example the, the police would, but you know it is certainly something to consider. Um, you know ultimately there are other examples where you know there um, are initiatives to protect people. Um, for example, Marac, Claire's Law and so forth, um, they don't require convictions to be, to, to, um, to be um, used. So it, it, just, it may be something to explore and consider, obviously with those rights of all parties involved being very, very carefully considered. Okay, thank you. Um, you also mentioned in your paper about the need for special measures to be fit for purpose um, and you know, reference to the feelings of technology. Um, mm -hmm. Do you want to just elaborate a little bit on, on the experience around special measures and has there been any improvement on the technology given the last year that we've had in terms of increased remote hearings and so on? Of course. Um, you know, this issue has arose in, in some research that Victim Support and I did. Um, uh, we uh, asked 10 ordinary members of the public to observe sexual violence trials between 2018 and 2019 and we released subsequently um, our bearing witness report and the failings in technology was one of the biggest um, and most glaring things that could be easily fixed um, because you had issues of people not being able to hear um, recordings, not being able to see people, not you know, and um, or just really you know badly recorded. Um, for example, um, interviews that would be used like for victims of, of, of sexual offences who are using their ABE interviews as their evidence in chief. Um, so 
it is something that um, you know we think is an issue. It's something that has been recognised across the board in criminal justice agencies as being an issue. Now, as to whether uh, how much that has improved given um, the shift um, of things online, um, I, I, I think that is something that we'd like to monitor over the over the next couple of months as the courts are opening up again and so forth. You know, and as things like the remote evidence centres are rolling out. Um, and certainly there's always going to be a lag with these things. At the end of the day, when you think of the amount of time between someone giving an ABE interview when an incident happens and the, sometimes several years later that, um, you know, there, that AB interview ends up in the courtroom setting. You know, it's it's not necessarily a case that you see these things, th these improvements happening immediately, but certainly it's something that we feel is a fix that like decisive action needs to be taken because at the end of the day for such crimes like this, when you have the special measures and they rely on technology for people to give their best evidence, um, it's really not okay that those measures are, are, are inadequate and not allowing juries to hear that full evidence. Okay, thank you, Louise. That's, that's been helpful. I'll bring in some members at this stage. So I have Linda, Dylan, then Sinead, and Rachel have indicated. So we'll take them in that order. So, Linda. Thank you, Chair. And um, you have covered some of my points already in terms of responses to the Chair and, and your your submission, your presentation. So thank you. <laughs> it's, it's been very positive. Just to, to tease out a wee bit in relation to the special measures. Obviously, that this was part of the domestic abuse bill, where special measures were carried over into the, the family and, and civil courts. I'm just wondering, is this something that was raised with the department? I mean, victim support were part of the reference group. Is it something that was raised with the department, and why do you think then they haven't taken on, taken it on, or what was the response if it was raised? Why not? When it was raised, what was their response? Sorry, Linda, um, you broke up a little. Sorry. Can you hear me clearly now? Um, but just, um, I, I can hear you. I, it was the first part I didn't catch. Um, what was it that um, we may or may, like you asked, we had been raised. I wasn't sure what it was you were asking. So, Louis, just to be clear, I'm asking, obviously you were part of the reference group, the department mm -hmm. reference group in relation to this bill. And I'm wondering, was the special measures um, in relation to civil and family courts raised during that and if it was what was the department's response um i it is a matter of policy that victim support um supports um the rollout of special measures in the family and civil courts and it is something that certainly um with the department we have spoken to them about um, and it's a conversation that we've continued to be having. Um, I'm not sure if we have you know completely um, won that argument yet in terms of, of, of complete rollout but certainly we feel that um, if someone is a victim in a criminal context, they do not stop being a victim when you go down the road um, in terms of family, in terms of civil, in terms of anything, even you know, including divorce and so forth. Um, and at the end of the day, if the case is proven for vulnerable victims in the criminal context, um, that you know, they, it doesn't cease to exist in, in that family context. So it's an ongoing conversation that we do, that we are having, and something that victims would be keen to see happening in the family and civil courts. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it does. I'm just, I'm just, I suppose I'm a bit confused as to why the department would push back on it because it is accepted in relation to the domestic abuse bill. And I don't know why we would not just, as you say, almost it should be auto automatic that it's carried over. I agree with you mm -hmm. in, in relation to that. So just in, around that chair, I think we should ask the department what their view on that is. Um, I would like to hear if they've got a difficulty with it, what the difficulty is and why because I, I would be, unless some, some very good argument is given as to why you wouldn't do that, I, I certainly would be supportive of it. Um, it'll come as no surprise to you that I absolutely support what you're saying around RSA. I've been consistent in the committee, and you're right, we're not the education committee, but we are the justice committee, and all things justice we're responsible for. We're not responsible for trying to come up with legislation to put people in jail. We're responsible to try and prevent them from ending up from committing the crimes and creating victims in the first place. So um, I think that it is important that we work closely with education and we keep pushing for that that real and meaningful education around what a healthy relationship looks like and what an unhealthy relationship looks like. It, for me, that is, is vital. The, the other issues that I had, Chair, have, have all been answered within the presentation and within your, your own question. So I'm content to... Um, 
leave it there and, and if there's anything else I can come back to it but I'm happy enough and thank you very much Louise. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair. I wonder if I could just make one further comment in, related to, in relation to what you said about RSE and that it's just that we're not talking about sex education, we're talking about safeguard, safeguarding. And I yep. think that is an important distinction to make. We are talking about safeguarding our children who are our future adults and um, and that is, I think, the focus that we need to have. And I think, you know, obviously, yes, it's not necessarily always the purview of justice, but I think that this could be one example of, you know, the, that great aspiration in our programme for government to sort of end that siloized way of working and, and do that. It is something that can be cross-departmental. Um, so I'm optimistic, you know, with the the, the, the noises being made about violence against women and girls strategy, that that could be one avenue that that could happen. So thank you. you know, I, I absolutely agree. It, it is around the relationship rather than just the, the, the sex. And, and that's relationships in every form, mm-hmm. whatever form they come. No, thank you. Thank you, Louise. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Linda. Thank um, you, too. Sinead Bradley, please. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Louise. Um, Chair, to be fair, both yourself and the Deputy Chair have covered uh, the points that I had wanted to just get some clarity on, and Louise, you have answered those well. So rather than than add to that, I'll maybe, um, and I know it's difficult, I'm not going to put in the spot in terms of the detail around the register, but I think it's an interesting idea, and it's definitely timely that we give that matter some consideration but I do wonder your presentation has been very good and specific where you you know you go clause by clause at times in the clause too so I'm just wondering if there's a bit of a contradiction here in terms of we would in my mind the register would be something that would capture repetitive behavior so it's a a warning or a a capture of um, that repetitive behaviour maybe against different victims um, and then clause two and I need to look at it in the context of the legislation but we're talking about a single act offence of threatening or abusive behaviour and I'm just wondering are there some parts that you know we may have intentions on one end and then because we're trying to broaden the capture of the actual offence in other parts that we're contradicting ourselves so it just, it's just a thought I'm having at this time. So I don't know if you, if you want to give any uh, consideration to that. But Louise, I think you made the point very well in regard to the RSA. You know, the, um, it's not about sex education. And this is repeatedly becoming clear the more we visit the domestic abuse piece and this. It is about those parameters of a healthy relationship. And I don't think we could repeat that too often because I think all of this um, type of legislation is going to be based on a good program of education and that being delivered. So I, I won't go over the earlier parts because you have covered them well. So thank you very much, Louise, but only if you have something to add on that other issue. I'd appreciate your thoughts. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sinead. Um, I suppose actually, you know, you, you'd point there that because this legislation is uh, under clause two is covering single act that you know um that you know doesn't uh, would that include be included in a register you know obviously not being on the spot or whatever but my my instinctive reaction is that like you say the intention behind a stalking register would be to capture serial perpetration either against the same person or against multiple people um, so to my mind a register would be more lent towards repeat conduct um, now as to how that would work operationally and so forth i'm not sure i don't necessarily think the existence of a register has to be tied to every single clause of the bill although i have to put my hands up and say i'm a victim's expert not an expert of, of legal and procedural minutia but um to my mind it would be something um that would be about serial um, perpetration and, and repeat acts um, and, and, and that would be the sort of the crux of it. Thank you, Louise. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Sinead. Um, Rachel Woods, please. Thanks, Chair. Um, hi, Louise. Good to see you. Thank you very much for your um, overview there. And I suppose a lot of the questions that I would have had have already been asked, so I'll not go into them. but. 
you know, I can't agree more on resourcing, training, data collection, reporting, monitoring, reviewing, and mandatory and comprehensive RSE. So, um, like Sinead, I don't think we can uh, say that enough. Um, and certainly appreciate you raising this again. It is crucially important for all of us and in terms of preventative action um, and safeguarding as well. But you'd mentioned at the start in terms of you deal with, um, obviously you deal with um, all types of victims and victim support, but could you give us sort of a bit of an overview um, of kind of the level of stalking uh, victims that you would deal with? Um, obviously we don't have a lot of data, if any, on victims of stalking in Northern Ireland because we don't collect that data and it's under her harassment, which covers a wide variety of behaviours. So if you could just give us a bit of an idea of, of how many, um, you know, if there's a rough numbers or if it's quite prevalent, because um, again, we don't have that for Northern Ireland yet. Thanks, Rachel. I suppose, you know, as you say, because we don't have a specific stalking law as yet, it's not something that is captured numerically or um, empirically, if you will. And um, what I can say is that, you know, you know, victims of stalking come through to us in lots of different ways. You can have, for example, someone who has, you know, who, who's um, going through the uh, harassment law procedure. And when you listen to their stories, you realize that this is very much stalking. And, you know, I suppose it, one of the reasons we're here today is that, you know, the harassment law does not capture the seriousness and, and sort of, in, you know, that um, sinister nature of, of, of a lot of stalking behaviors. And um, so we would see that coming through um, and would, you know, provide general support and um, emotional support as we do both in terms of um, in the immediate aftermath of stalking taking place and then also if it, it comes to um, for example a court um, process and um, we would our witness service would be there and um, to give them a separate space in the courts so that they can sit and not have actually come in contact with the defendant we would also provide um, free support and um, if they um, if they were um, wanting to apply for criminal injuries compensation, and I suppose finally that the were the sort of more serious. I'm uh, sorry, excuse me. Um, when I say serious, I mean um, stalking behaviours that possibly also involve um, sexual violence. We have our independent sexual violence advocates, and you know the things we see coming through there tend to be, but obviously not exclusively, it tend to be um, cases of um, you know domestic abuse with with serious sexual elements and serious stalking. Prop, 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 uh, potentially by ex-partners and so forth although like I say not exclusively the case but then you have really the sharp end of the wedge there in terms of the extreme levels of, of sexual violence that have taken place in the past um, and then the, the dangerous escalating stalking behaviours that are tied in with um, a domestic abuse relationship where you have a sort of zero-sum power relationship between um, a offender and victim so you know there is a breadth that we see um, obviously you know we, we also work with other agencies um, in terms of, of making sure that victims Victims are getting the tailored support they need. We work with the likes of Nexus, with Women's Aid, with Men's Advisory Project, and so on. Um, but I think as a collective, there's, uh, the, the agencies that support victims, you know, we do see a breadth of it in Northern Ireland, just like anywhere else. Um, and it is, you know, obviously crucial that um, when we're, you know, while we have a law that covers all, that in terms of the training and the and, and the rollout and the guidance, that it that that reflects the different specificities of different kinds of stalking and, and, and presentations. Thank you, Louise. Um... I suppose, I think you've already answered my question, but um, again, I know this is something that we looked at in domestic abuse bill and then put on the face of the legislation, but um, would you support victim support, support training being made mandatory for criminal justice agencies and partners then on stalking? Yes, we absolutely would. And I think, do you know what, I, I don't think it's an us versus them kind of thing. I think, you know, you know, people who are in those criminal justice agencies, they're, they're employees and they're human beings. And um, it's only reasonable that if you haven't received training, a specialist training on something, you err on, on the side of caution because you're just trying to do your job correctly and within the parameters of what you're given. Um, so I think, you know, you know, I'm, I'm minded to think of the, of the evidence that was given by, um, by, by DCS at McNally last week um, about how the police would like, you know, they're obviously to be resourcing and training and so forth and not just a one-off 40 minute online video. Like this requires um, ongoing lifetime kind of career training um, for for police and for, for, for um, agency staff um, because um, stalking is changing. Stalkers um, are obviously motivated perpetrators who use everything at their disposal. And I think, you know, we need to be making sure that we are equipping 
our justice agencies, our statutory agencies, with those tools and not setting them up to fail. And to do that, we need to be giving them effective training, the space to have the training, to do the training, and um, and also the space and the resourcing for them to, like I said, be able to be investigating and, and take, putting the time in to, to do the longer investigative work that's required for course of conduct crimes like stalking and, and, and like um, like course of control and domestic abuse. Thank you, Louise. Couldn't agree more. Um, and finally, just as something that was in your submission as well as was in the submission by Women's Aid, we heard from Sonia last week, um, where you'd mentioned about our history of conflict and the continued prevalence of paramilitaries, ex-paramilitaries in the community. I wonder if you would be able to elaborate a wee bit more on this. What kind of experience do you have, you know, with the people that you're working with on that? Is it very similar? I'm sure, I don't know if you saw Sonia's um, submission uh, to the committee last week, but is it, would that be of a, of a similar um, a similar experience of victim support then? Yes, it would be. And yeah, I did. I, I, I tuned in to, um, to hear Sonia's evidence. Um, and yes, that it, we would experience something quite similar. I think, you know, most support agencies across the board um, would, would, would probably agree with that, though I can't speak for them. Um, our experience is that, you know, whilst it's not always um, official paramilitary organizational issue, um, certainly you have individuals and communities with paramilitary links um, or, or, or um, you know, power that is gleaned from that. Um, the problem with that is obviously the, the fear that that can engender, um, and the fear that is often, you know, proven to be to be possibly true by by the actions of those perpetrators. So, you know, when it comes to um, that kind of of issue, that is an extra safety consideration and safeguarding consideration for victims. It is also something that may make them less likely to be able to give their best evidence, and and because because of fears for their own safety. So it is something that we very much need to take into consideration because obviously, um, with within our communities, um, like I said, it may not be an official structure, but you still may have people who are operating. Um, under under the guise of being paramilitarily linked and 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 the power and fear that that engenders as part of that, not only to the whole community but also to those individuals in their lives and the women in their lives, um, can be it can be truly terrifying, um, and and is, is very much a safety concern. Thank you, Louise. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, Gemma Dolan, please. Thanks, Chair, and thanks, Louise, for your presentation. I just have one question, Louise, around the stalking register. Um, is this something Victim Support has raised with the department? And if so, what was the reaction? Sorry, Gemma, you broke up with me there. Um, you said it's something we've raised with the department? Yes. Uh, has there been any interaction? Okay. Um, to, to my knowledge, um, this is you know this is something that we feel like I think is as a reasonably new kind of um, thinking. It's something that you know we have um, you know we would we would like to see. It is something that um, you know we, we are in support of. I suppose um, it's not necessarily something that we have pushed as our absolute number one priority. And um, in, in all the work we do to support victims, like obviously when you see the um the like the likes of the domestic abuse bill coming through and and trying to get this bill across the line, there is. Uh, we, we do. We have had, uh, as you, I'm sure you noticed, uh, like quite a laundry list of things that we wanted to to, to happen. Um, but certainly, um, you know, a stalking register we think would be um, a really useful tool. We do understand that maybe more consideration is required. Um, like I said earlier, um, to balance um, the, the, the competing rights and make sure that we're getting it right and not just rolling out some quite um, ad hoc or uh, not that I think that that would happen anyway, because I think we, you know, the department are very considered when it comes to you know big and radical changes like this. So certainly, you know, it's 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 something that we would like to see, but I, we do appreciate that there may be more thinking that needs to go into it. Okay, thanks, Louise. Thanks, Chair. That's me. Okay, and the last one on this session is Paul Free. Uh, thank you, Louise. Good to see you again. Um, Hi, Paul. Uh, even through even through technology, it's still good uh, to interact. Uh, I suppose my question, uh, can, if I can go into the detail with you a wee bit more, uh, I'm not sure. I've tried to see in your submission if you're content with the tariff set for Clause One, that being the ten years or a fine or both for uh, conviction or indictment, you'll, you'll know that domestic violence brings uh, 14 years, not exceeding 14 years. Are, are victim support, uh, are they mute on this point or do you have a preference? Um, well, sorry, it's, I'll, I'll be honest, Paul, it's not something that I've considered in any great detail, but I suppose um, it would be fair to say that it, you know, uh, 
very, you know, we be, we're not saying that there is any, should be any kind of hierarchy of these kind of crimes and stalking is very serious. So it may be a matter of, of you know, taking a look at you know this law versus you know domestic abuse law and, and, and doing some kind of standardization. The one thing that we did look at was um, the, the, the tariff set in terms of the stalking protection orders and the fact that um, in Northern Ireland it was six, that it was um, six months um, as opposed to twelve months, which was um, elsewhere in, in GB. And you know our suggestion was that maybe that should be we should we should standardise that to twelve months. And um, for for I suppose a number of reasons, um, and I know that the reasons have already been cited by others in, in, in their own evidence sessions, but um short you know, ultimately, we know from 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 experience and from research globally that very short sentences don't really make a, a bit of difference when it comes to the actual restorative and rehabilitative um, element of things. And so, it, um, you know, uh, it, there may be um, not enough time there to actually consider. Um, you know, the, the impact of behaviours and so forth. So, um, you know, that is something that we had thought of. But, but certainly, you know, it may be a case of, of, of for the overall tariff standardising. We certainly think that, you know, um, that the legislation as it stands does re reflect the seriousness of, of, of stalking and that is to be welcomed. Um, but I suppose beyond that comment, I, 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 can't, um, I can't say that I'm, I'm, I'm enough of a legal expert to be able to get into the minutia of tariffs and so forth. Okay, no, I understand and appreciate that. You, you, do, you do talk about the stalking register and that's on everyone's lips, there's no doubt about it. And especially when we've seen the moves over in uh, GB, England Wales with regards to the legislation there and the process and the, the failure to adopt a register uh, and that has surprised me to be honest with you uh, but when I look back on the detail on that um, the register is one thing but then we have the protection arrangements I'm not sure if victim support is involved in Papani, I'm not sure excuse me for my ignorance but I suppose my question is my question is, if, if we don't have a register, is there anything that we can put in place on statute that would, that would encapsulate uh, safeguards in the Papani arrangements so that, and this will be at the other end of convictions of course, mm -hmm. that, that people then would be uh, part of that Papani arrangements, that they would be managed and monitored and that in itself might bring assurance and safeguarding towards victims. Uh, and, and if that is the, the, the logical step, if you don't have a register, can that work without a register? Um, and also, what would that arrangement actually look like? Would it be a mirror image of, of arrangements that you would have in place for uh, sexual crimes and perpetrators? Or would it be nuanced to suit stalking uh, perpetrators? Wow, that's a really good question. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Um, I think you know, um, we uh, we would be involved um, to an extent to, in in Papani. Like for example, we sit on the victim or witness subgroup um, in terms of um, you know to make sure that there is a victim's voice um, with within like the workings of Papani. Um, I, I think. Obviously, if you have a case where um, you know you have someone who's convicted of stalking, you know something similar to Papani could be um, put in place in terms of those monitoring arrangements. And actually, that might be you know if you had someone who like where you know where we are talking about um, like serious serious offences where by you know there is um, a demonstrable danger of of reoffending or, or or risk of harm. It, it, it may be valuable. I think obviously in terms of anything, we have good sort of templates. For how we deal with things, and um, for example, in the existing Papani arrangements, and um, you also have sort of on the on the flip side of things like I've already mentioned, and um, the likes of risk assessment in terms of Marac, in terms of domestic abuse, and that doesn't require um, convictions. And um, I think um, there is, a, I suppose, a stepping through of all those options and um, to find a tailored stalking response and a tailored stalking set of arrangements that that, that is, is suitable for this type of crime that should be done. And maybe there is a, there is a, a piece of work there. Um, to do that, but certainly um, the, the, the theory and the idea behind having protection arrangements um, put in place is a very, very good one and something that I think more work could be done to, um, to, to look into. Just one more question on the register. Sh should, do you think that you should be added to a register if you have been convicted once of stalking? Or 
should you be added to a register when you've been convicted twice of stalking with two different people? To, and that, that mm. I suppose, demonstrates the serial, serial aspect to it, rather than the fixation on one person. Yeah, I suppose that these are these are the difficulties they're in, aren't they? Of of the the idea behind a stalking register, and you know, um, we we you know obviously it's usually quite difficult, particularly with course of conduct crimes for for conviction to take place. Hopefully, this law will change that, um, and 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 you know obviously I, I'm optimistic in that regard. Um, that said, I would say that um, serial conviction is not the only measure of serial perpetration. If you speak to the police, if you speak to support agencies like ourselves, it is not uncommon that we're all very aware of serial perpetrators. They may not have been convicted at all, um, but they could be flagged and the police are well known um, to, to local police. Um, and and, and, and that, that is um, you know intelligence that exists. Um, I suppose, in the current state of affairs, um, I would say that that would be, you know, is obviously a very useful kind of marker of, of serial perpetration when you have that kind of, um, you know, um, knowledge of police. That said, obviously, um, now that we are going to have this stalking law, um, you know, you can have, um, for example, and we will have hopefully a, a more convictions for stalking. That said, it takes, as, as we know, several years sometimes for those to get right through to the, um, to, um, the, the the system. So the question then would be, if you have someone who we know to be a serial stalker, um, um, and they are being they're being prosecuted, they've been prosecuted once. Do we wait many many years for multiple prosecutions and multiple convictions, and before we put them on the register? Um, I, I would say maybe that that could be an, an abundance of caution. Um, but again, I think it is something. These are discussions that need to be had to tease out those um, th those the balance of, of human rights there um, in terms of. Um, right, rights of the accused and victim safety. Okay, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Louise. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Paul. Well, Louise, thank you for your time, and that's very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Chair and Committee. And if there's anything else that you require from us, please do not hesitate to ask. We'll take you up on that. Thank you. Okay, members, let's move into the second of the four or 11 sessions that we have today. That's the first one uh, completed, so uh, I'll move straight into that. There's a copy of the submission in page 25 and 26 of your meeting pack. It's the multi-agency stocking project. So let me welcome Ms. Shauna Dillon, Chief Executive Officer, um, and Aurora New Dawn Limited, Dr. Kirsty uh, Butcher, Chartered Principal, Clinical Psychologist and Clinical Lead, and Ms. Victoria Tunbridge, uh, Chartered Principal Forensic Psychologist and Clinical Lead, all from the Multi-Agency Stalking uh, Project. Um, so you're all very welcome. It'll be reported by Hansard and published on the committee page in due course. So I think I'm going to hand over to Shauna to provide us a um, overview just of some of the key issues, and then we'll turn to members for questions. Shauna, thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, stalking is often described by our clients as terrifying and intrusive. Often victims feel a sense of loss of control and privacy, something that's very often, that very often has long-term negative impacts in many, many areas of their lives. At Aurora, we use the definition from our colleagues at the Susie Lampley Trust, who run the National Stalking Helpline. A pattern of fixated and obsessive behaviour which is repeated, persistent, intrusive, and causes fear of violence or engenders alarm and distress in the victim. We also think of it this way, an imposition of a relationship where one would not otherwise exist. Stalking is a very unique and often seemingly bizarre crime which occurs outside the context of a relationship. It is driven by a fixation and obsession of the stalker on their victim. Whilst we do often see similar behaviour in abusive relationships where digital and physical monitoring behaviours are present, stalking occurs where there is no relationship. Stalking can start after the end of a relationship, however, for the victim, the relationship is no longer there. The stalker is trying to impose that relationship and contact on their victim regardless of whether they want it. It is also important to understand that not all stalking is perpetrated by ex-partners. There are many reasons why someone may stalk someone else. Although nearly 90% of our victims are being stalked by an ex-intimate partner, we extend our service to all victims of stalking, because an offender could be a previous friend, 
patient, colleague, neighbour, an acquaintance or stranger. It's our view that the implementation of stalking legislation is essential to protect victims from this psychologically pervasive, dangerous and sometimes tragically fatal crime. But importantly, we would note that legislative frameworks are just the start of a conversation in the response needed for the pre prevention of stalking. Any change in legislation needs to then be supported by training and culture change and adequate funding to support statutory responses, including, for example, criminal justice and health agencies. But most importantly, from Aurora's perspective, it's essential that additional sustainable funding is provided for independent specialist male violence against women sector organisations to respond to the needs of victims. Okay, thank you, Shauna. Just a couple of uh, questions um, f for me. In terms of the, the multi-agency project, um, it, it's funded by government. Um, is there other similar projects in England and Wales? Um, yes, there are. I think there's four now. I will refer to um, Kirsty and Victoria, but um, the, uh, the three first ones were Hampshire, Cheshire and the Met Police. Um, and now there's an additional one, um, which I've forgotten where it is, but I can ask Kirsty, can ask Kirsty and Victoria. Um, and it's not now centrally funded by government, it's now locally funded. Um, so it's different, uh, different pockets of funding um, for different areas of the stalking um, response in Hampshire. Okay, thank you. Um, if I can bring in Sinead Bradley at this stage, please. Thank you, Chair, and um, thank you, Shauna and Kirsty and Victoria for that. Just something you said there, um, Sean, I was wondering if you could just elaborate on it, about the relationship between the stalker and the person being stalked. You're saying that there is no relationship there by definition, um, so it's an opposed one. And I'm wondering, do you think, because our legislation isn't as prescriptive as that, of the proposed legislation, and that relationship um, part, uh, does it exclusively have to be someone who is not in a relationship that is a stalker? Um, I suppose that what I'm talking about is the context of what it means to, in, in terms of how it feels from the victim. So I'm talking about it from a, a victim's advocate perspective. Is it's the it's the imposition of a relationship. So it can be very often it is ex intimate partner. Um, so. And that's where you have to get into the context of understanding where it, where it, the balance moves from harassment or coercive control into stalking, um, because it becomes that obsession and fixation. And from a victim's perspective, obviously we know, um, in terms of domestic abuse, that victims will minimise um, what's happening for them. They will, um, because they've often been coercively controlled as well, they will explain away that stuff. So it's really important for us as organisations, whether they be third sector or statutory, that we understand what the context of stalking means. So in terms of your legislation, I don't think it's that different from ours in that sense. It's just that the it's the imposition of a relationship where the victim doesn't want any contact, doesn't want any of those, those intrusive things happening. Um, and that relationship in, in essence for them doesn't exist but for the stalker and the, uh, you know i'm not going to go into the typologies of stalking because that's where my colleagues will come in but the the um, obsession and fixation is um, led by the stalker does that make sense my answering your question yes it does Shana, and it's a very refined um answer and a very specific piece that really we need to give consideration to because it is about understanding that we've just been through the domestic abuse piece and it is understanding that the actions could be very similar or the same, but the relationship to the victim could be a defining piece in whether it is domestic abuse or stopping. So yeah, yeah so yeah, that's, that's a point really worth making and I appreciate you making it because it's certainly worthy of consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you, Sinead. Um, I'll bring in Paul for you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks very much for your presentation. Could I just ask, just with regards to the service you provide, you're a multi-agency grouping, but do you actually, I take it you work with offenders too? 
Is that correct? Yeah, I'll refer to my colleagues there. Okay, so um, we're a multi-agency team. So Kirsty and myself work for Southern Health. Um, Shona and her colleagues are from Aurora New Dawn. Then we also work with Hampshire Constabulary and with the National Probation Service in Hampshire on the Isle of Wight. So Aurora New Dawn obviously work with the victims and the rest of us work with the perpetrators. Okay, and, and is that deemed over there as controversial? Or, or was, there, was there barriers that you had to break down in order to get going with your work? Or is it, is it seemed, does it seem to be now uh, best practice, what you guys do? Well, 50% of people who commit stalking offences go on to commit further offences, either against the same or another victim. So if you actually want to protect victims, you actually need to work with the perpetrators. Yeah, I, I agree with you, but, but did you find it hard to break down... Uh, popular myths or, or... I think it's about putting everything in context and explaining why we're doing exactly what we're doing. Yeah. We're doing the work with the perpetrators to stop the victims experiencing further offences against them and further distress. And if we don't work with the perpetrators, that's not going to happen. So, so you, you maybe heard the last session there with victim support when I asked the question around uh, the PANI, which is our public protection arrangements. Uh, so do you guys think it's a good idea that there would be one, a register, uh, and two, how, how then would that work in uh, Papani arrangements whereby you're either monitoring or uh, managing perpetrators? So I'm not very clear on your Papani arrangements um, in Northern Ireland. In terms of a register, um, I think there are pros and cons to it. Um, I think because of the high reoffending rate, there are definite advantages to it. Um, but I think uh, one of the difficulties with something like a register means that if someone actually has some effective treatment and moves on and stops reoffending, how to, to making sure that they can leave that behind. So it's about how people access that information on the register. Um, to enable them to move on and end that part of that life. But I think there will be, for safety reasons, there are definite advantages for that information being shared amongst agencies and being available to people. OK. And, and a wee bit more about your organisation itself. You're, you're funded through government, I take it? Um, well, we, we have ongoing funding issues. Um, so this year, we are funded 50% by health and 50% by the Ministry of Justice through the Offender Personality Disorder Pathway. But yet again, we've just got funding for one year. Right, okay. And yeah. we're funded by the um, Office of the Police and Crime Commissioner. Yeah, and I'm sure that's very challenging when you're getting uh, funding from all sorts and different pots. So I, 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 I sympathise with you because we have the same problems over here. Uh, whenever there's a, a joint responsibility for funding. Can I ask then, I don't know if you've had a chance to really study Orbell over here, but of course uh, Clause 1 is the offence of stalking, and then we have a Clause 2 which is an offence of threatening or abusive behaviour, which is, is more like a one-off offence. Um, is there anything, if you have had time to study this, is there anything within those two clauses that, that alarm you? or that you think we've missed out on? I'm really glad you asked that because I was left wondering whether I'd completely misunderstood the threatening and abusive behaviour. Because if it's a one-off incident, um, then for me that's not stalking because stalking is a pattern, it's repeated. Um, and if it isn't repeated and it isn't a pattern, to me it's not stalking. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I get, I I get that, and I suppose that's that's why they've they've labelled this offence then of threatening or abusive behaviour. One thing that does uh, intrigue me is that in that second clause, that that second offence of threatening or, or abusive behaviour, it has the terminology whereby uh, if A intends by the behaviour to cause fear or alarm, or is reckless as to whether the behaviour causes fear and alarm. Now that terminology around recklessness is included in Clause 2, but it's nowhere in Clause 1, which is the main offence of stalking. Um, 
And again, I, I know I'm going into detail with you here and you maybe don't have it in front of you, but does that seem strange to you? That you would have a recklessness in, in, in one offence, which is the one-off offence, but not in the, the actual stalking offence itself? I mean, from my perspective, from the victim's perspective, it's the definition of what recklessness means, um, how that's defined, how that's implemented in terms of the criminal justice agencies. Um, and very much the onus is, is on victims a lot of the time to prove or to catalogue the offences against them. So um, the more complicated it is for victims, the harder it is to, to get any kind of retribution. Um, in terms of the legalities of it, you know, we do have colleagues at the, at the MASP that um, are from CPS, and we can definitely ask them to give you a written response to that, yeah. um, because I think they would be the experts on it. Um, yeah. I don't know if Kirsty or Victoria have got any views on that. No, okay, listen, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, can I bring in Linda Dillon, then we'll have Rachel, and then we'll have Doug in that order. So, Linda, if you want to come in, thank you. Sorry, Chair. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, Chair. Th thank you very much for the for the presentation and for your views on this. Just in relation to the, um, you have outlined some of the challenges that you're having working through, and considering the motivation and the mental health of some stalkers and, and then the development of programs around that. Can, can you just outline what what are those challenges, and what types of treatment programs could be considered? I think Kirsty might be having trouble with her sound. Can anybody else hear her? No, I can't. Sorry. Okay. Um, I'll answer. <laughs> no, you're good. Do you want to see? Um, in terms of treatment, um, as you all know, we, nobody knows what works with stalkers at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things that was um, the reason for the pilots was to actually try different things mm -hmm. um, and to see what works. So we're currently carrying on with this at the moment. Um, the therapies that we're using are cognitive analytic therapy, um, schema therapy, um, some dialectical behaviour therapy, and it's very much dependent on the needs of the um, individual that we're working with um, and the function of their behaviours. Because um, stalking perpetrators are also different. If you've got an ex intimate, mm -hmm. that's very different than if you've got someone, um, say, who's a resentful stalker and complaining to the organisation, which again is very different um, from someone who's looking for a relationship and has never actually met the person that's stalking. So we're kind of trying, we're working in a way where we're trying to fit it to the needs of mm -hmm. the individual to be most effective. Um, I think one of the difficulties is, and I know that our colleagues in the prison service find, is that there isn't actually any programs at the moment in prisons for stalkers. Um, so there's something about, there's lots of people in prison at the moment with stalking convictions and nothing, you know, no work's being done with them. Um, so I think one of the difficulties you've got when you have stalking legislation and such high reconviction rates is what do you do to reduce that? And, and we are still in really early days. Yeah, ju just in relation then to what you're saying, given that, that Shauna said that 90% of, of stock and behaviour is, you know, ex-partner. Can I just um, stop you there? Can you? In all referrals, only 67% are ex-intimate. So we've got well, quite... Yeah, so, so I suppose it, either way, uh, the, the question will remain the same, to be fair. The, is, is there crossover in terms of programmes? So I, I know what you're saying, there may not be programs within the prison at the moment around stalking but if somebody has been convicted of stalking but you know that there has been previous domestic violence and sexual violence um, are the programs that would be in place for those being used or because they've been specifically um, convicted of stalking are, are they unable then to avail of those programs? So those who are ex-intimate, so those, that's 67%, mm -hmm. um, um, might be referred for BBR, which is Building Better Relationships, which is um, a domestic abuse programme. 
But what we're finding and what they're beginning to um, come out to the um, research evidence is that whilst it works really well on the domestic abuse behaviours, it's still leaving those stalking behaviours um, yeah. kind of untouched. In terms of predatory um, stalkers, what we found um, and what the research indicates is that the sex offender treatment programmes work um, looking at that sexual offending behaviour and relapse prevention stuff, but what it's not doing is um, working on that kind of that entitlement around the relationship um, and kind of the perceptions and justifications of that. So it's working on what's happening is we're targeting bits of the problem, yeah. but we're not getting the underlying bit. Yeah, oh no, that's okay. I appreciate that. That's really what I kind of wanted to find out. You know, is there potential for some of those programs having, you know, some benefits? But I, I think you're right to think if it's not dealing with the stock and then they're not appropriate, it's not. It's almost connected. like they're getting part of it. We almost need yeah. like an additional module or something on them. Okay, no problem. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Linda. Um, Rachel Woods, please. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Victoria Kirsty and Shona, for that. Um, a lot, uh, again, has been answered already. But um, just with regard to um, a couple of things in your submission, around um, the challenges, you said about challenges that have included a lack of understanding within the police and CPS um, about what stalking is and issues in communication between two agencies. Have you seen any improvements over the last number of years? Obviously, your stalking offences have been in place for... Uh, since 2012, has there been any improvements in that? Or are you guys the improvements in that? Is that what you're saying? Of course, yes. No, <laughs> I think I think um, working in a uh, in a multi agency way, in true multi agency partnership, um, where everyone at the table is uh, um, has an equal footing, um, then yes, of course, there's there's benefits. And you know, in in terms of Hampshire, we've been doing some level of stalking work since 2013 and we haven't always got it right um, so you know if there's things to learn from stuff that we haven't always got right then please do ask us um, i do think that there are, there is a, a definite improvement from from my perspective um, when i have um, you know observed um, the clinic and all that i looked at you know or talk to our stalking advocates there's a definite improvement in terms of um, the relationship between, or the understanding actually from CPS and police, because from our perspective for victims, we have, we are the voice of the victim at the table. So we are able to, um, when there's kind of uh, prescribed, if you like, legal um, terminology or investigations, we can put the voice of the victim at the center of that. Um, and, you know, now we have a system whereby it, you know, we all know each other. So it can be as simple as an email, it can be as simple as a, you know, lots of work goes on outside of any clinic work. It can be as simple as we've got relationships. Can I just check something out with you? Um, and or that, you know, we can have the challenging conversations, you know, um, and that's what victim advocates do anyway, about, um, you know, some of the advice that maybe would come from legal experts or, or from the police. And we can say, well, that's not working for the victim because she's done X, Y, and Z. So, um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but I've definitely seen an improvement in, you know, holistically in multi-agency relationships. Certainly for us with health, we were never sat at the table at all together until, um, until the MASP stuff um, really came, came to fruition. So that's been a massive benefit to us because we've been able to learn about the mental health of stalkers and that really informs as well our response and our safety plans for victims. Thank you very much. That certainly does. Um, it brings me nicely on to my other question and this might not be a question, but more something that the committee could look at or, or maybe um, we just we have to sort of discuss it amongst ourselves. But in terms of the motivation and mental health of stalkers, um, and you of oh, in your submission you said about becoming aware of that through the clinic, um, and then there are a number of different therapeutic approaches and different um, programs that we're looking at. Um, but I suppose Paul has already touched on. This is mentioned on recklessness, which is which is within our legis proposed legislation. 
um, and how recklessness would be defined in it. How, how is that working with um, the English um, offence? Uh, and again, I don't expect you to have this in front of you. If you do have like a reasonableness defence in there, there is in ours, um, and it's in it, it's in um, section two, I think it is. No, it's not section two. It's section five, and um, it's section five C about the reasonable in particular circumstances. That's not defined in the in the front of the bill. I'm, so what I'm kind of trying to get at is is how are mental health issues dealt with. Is that separately, or are people convicted underneath that? Um, do you see a lot of people coming through with mental health issues on stalking behaviours? And is there a defence of reasonableness in your stalking defence? And is, do you see that being used? Um, again, very wide and nitty gritty issues there, but um, it's, it's, it's certainly something that I've, I've seen in the submissions to this bill and, and had um, constituents contact me about, you know, how is mental health going to be treated within this legislation? And is that a defence against, you know, um, against conviction? I think we still can't hear Kirsty. <laughs> Sorry, Kirsty. Um, <clears throat> I can partly answer that, and I think we're going to have to get um, some of our, our colleagues to get back to you from um, the CPS. 45% of our referrals have had mental health difficulties. Um, but from our experience, because we work part through health and part through um, funding by the Ministry of Justice, is that what, in my experience, and this might not be what happens generally, is that people get convicted but then get a mental health disposal. So we've been working with people on Section 3741s um, who are kind of insecure hospitals, and it's dealt with that way. Um, so I guess there is always the uh, kind of diminished responsibility, but we haven't come across people with those, but they would still end up, I would guess, with a mental health disposal. But we can seek clarification around that for you. Um, Thank but mental you. health difficulties are a big problem uh, okay. in perpetrators. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Rachel. Okay, Doug. I'm sorry, uh, Chair. Th thank you. Uh, thanks, Shauna and Kirsty and, and Victoria. I mean, it's fascinating, I've got to say. It's an awful subject, but it's, it's absolutely fascinating. And I'm fascinated about talking about the perpetrators and, and the issues around prevention. Uh, and mental health and the reoffending uh, and the offendi offender personality disorder. Can I just ask, when you look at the offender um, personality disorder, is there any identifiable, identifiable patterns? I, I know we talk about ex-intimates and predatory, but is there any other identifiable, identifiable patterns within that? Uh, and secondly, could, could you maybe outline some of the therapies that you talked about for offenders, just to give us an idea of them. I do need to go through them all, but just a, maybe an idea of what they are. Uh, and the last one is, do you ever get many who self-refer back to yourselves, who, who haven't gone through your pro processes and therapies and maybe come out the other end of the criminal justice system, who find themselves back in the same similar position, who come back to you and say, I might need some help here? Okay, if I forget some of your questions halfway through, <laughs> do you remind me? I think Curse is left hoping to join us with um, a sound. Um, so, identifiable personality disorder patterns. We are really, really at the beginning of our journey. Um, we didn't start till September 2018, and we're collecting that information now. And what there does seem to be is there does seem to be some patterns which we're looking into at the moment. So, for example, someone with, who's a predatory stalker, you're likely to find kind of the antisocial personality disorder um, and a kind of the narcissistic personality disorder. Mm -hmm. In terms of the intimacy seek, you're looking at more of um, kind of the schizoidy, schizotypal personality disorders. Um, the rejected could be, you know, it, I think what we're finding is it's quite early days. The rejected seem to be less clear cut than some of the others because it's an ex-intimate and is often linked with domestic abuse and moving on. Um, I think ask us again in five years time and we'll be able to give you some really clear stuff um, but we're still very much at the beginning of our journey and the other thing to be really aware of is we're not doing per proper personality disorder assessments on people so some people are coming diagnosed and with other people we're looking at them going they've definitely got traits of x y and z but would they meet that full diagnostic criteria 
Mm. Um, and I think in thinking about future proofing our service, we're thinking about what we need to do and what we can show. And one of those things that would be really good is with those people who we think do have a personality disorder to be able to test them. But obviously there's legal rights and things to consider in there. So I think there definitely will be, but it's about when someone has enough information to kind of pull that together. Uh, oh, on the other question, sorry, I probably threw them all at, at once. Actually, Victoria, I'm sorry. But the therapies that you talked about, you did mention some therapies, yeah. and, and, and they sounded fascinating, but I have no idea what they were. Okay. Uh, could you just maybe just give us an example, you know, and the time frame one of the therapies would be? Okay. So we're doing um, therapy with a small number of people um, just because we're such a small team. Um, Kirsty yeah. and I are the equivalent of one full time post. To give okay. you kind of some idea. Um, so um, I'm currently doing um, cognitive analytic therapy with someone um, and I'll be seeing them for 24 sessions, that's 24 weeks. Um, and then I'll see them for a one month follow up, a three month follow up and a six month follow up. Um, oh, what, is that? What, what does that consist of? Okay, so the idea first of all is um, kind of reformulation, helping them to make sense of what they're doing and why they're doing it. Because when you actually dig down, you find that these are repeating patterns that have often happened in other relationships to some extent or another. It's about an entitlement of a relationship, a fear of being lost, a fear of rejection, um, and making those links in how they interact with other people as well as the victim of the stalking. Um, then looking at the pros and cons about why they might want to change what they're doing, the damage it's doing to them as well as to others, and then helping them to recognise what they're doing in the moment, either to the victim or to other people. So even if they're not re-offending anymore, they'll still be thinking about it. They'll still be planning ways to do it. They might be surreptitiously looking at Facebook, you know, people's Twitter accounts. They might be looking at their friends' accounts to find out where they've been going and just making them aware of what they're doing. And then you'll be looking um, at revision about changing what they're doing, exits out of it, having a really clear relapse prevention plan, making sure they know that if they start doing kind of X, the next thing that's going to happen is Y and then Z. So actually, what do they do and how can they do that differently? Um, and the reason we're, I mean, we're doing CAT. I'm doing CAT because I like CAT. Kirstie's doing schema um, because that's her therapy of choice. Um, I'm also doing DBT because I'm working with a number of people with borderline personality disorder who are self-harming and suicidal, so it's about stabilising them as well as doing the work as well. And, and see, when you, see when you do this all, Victoria, uh, you know, do, 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 do they go away and suddenly realise, look, I have got a problem and even have to, even once, uh, that sounds silly, but you, you know, even though they've gone through the 24 weeks with you and, and they're at the other end, do they know they've still got a problem and, and then therefore they can identify that problem in themselves and be able to go and seek help? Because, you know, it's at the point about here in Northern Ireland, then, I mean, do we need to make sure that there's something out there where people can go and seek help when they realise they've got a problem? Yes, you definitely do. Because I think one of the issues we've got is that it depends very much on motivation. Um, so I've done therapy with one person and who at the end of therapy still felt that he wasn't stalking and he wasn't fixated. And if only the victim met him, she would fall in love with him. Right. Um, I've worked with someone else who at the end of it is really clear, who's got some great relapse prevention skills now, who knows what his triggers are, um, who talks to people, who's built a new kind of network around himself to stop him doing that. So it very much comes back to, as with any therapy, the individual's motivation to change, the, you know, their motivation to do something differently. And I think you mentioned one other point, can people self-refer back to us? At the moment, no. And one of the other difficulties we've got is we've had some referrals where they aren't held by another agency. And because we're such a small team and how we're set up, we can't pick them up. And that's a real negative at the moment. But, and we're trying to find a solution around it. Um, and I think if there, there really does need to be that because there are people who would like some help who aren't under the criminal justice system yet, but they can't access it. Mm. But I'm not sure how you do that. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a conundrum. But listen, um, thank you very much indeed. Fascinating, really, really interesting. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Doug, and can I thank um, all the witnesses for taking the time to, to be with us today. So, um, on behalf of the committee, you have my appreciation, and if there's anything that we need to follow up on, we, we will do so in due course. So, thank you. Okay, members, we're going to move on to the next um, oral evidence session. Um, it's agenda item six, and uh, we should have um, Emma Hildreth, the Senior Policy Advisor from the Susie Lambla 
uh, trust with us um, via the Starley facility. So pages 28 and 29 of your meeting pack has got a copy of the written submission. So hopefully I'm able to formally welcome Emma to the meeting. Um, thank you for joining us. We'll record this by Hansard. We'll publish a transcript on the community webpage in due course. So Emma, can I hand over to you to give us a brief outline of the key issues um, from your perspective and then we'll pick it up with some questions. Thank you, Emma. Yes, uh, thank you for having me today. Um, we're really pleased to be invited along to give um, evidence. Um, so as you will all have seen our, our written evidence submission, and just to give you a bit of background about the Susie Lamplew Trust, we were established in 1986 uh, by Susie's parents following her disappearance. Um, we're a personal safety and stalking charity and we actually run the National Stalking Helpline um, across the UK. So we speak to thousands of victims every year about their experiences of stalking. Um, we're really, really pleased to see the introduction of this legislation. Um, for us, it's something that is, you know, obviously really kind of close to our hearts in terms of um, that recognition of the the importance of the recognition of the specific events of stalking. Um, it's really important, particularly um, from our perspective, speaking to victims, that that the recognition of stalking as a standalone offence gives victims the, the power they need to come forward and actually demand a response from the criminal justice system. Um, one of the main kind of points we want to just raise at this stage is, however, for us, it's the start of the journey. Um, we've had legislation in England and Wales and Scotland um, now for some time, and we still see very low numbers of uh, reports and prosecutions. So it's really important that this is seen as the first stage in that journey to, towards greater recognition of stalking. But it's actually the introduction of the training and the guidance that goes along with it that will be pivotal in actually making it work, which I'm sure you're all aware of, but it's just worth us kind of reiterating that point. And it's something that we're still working on now in terms of making sure that everyone is aware of what stalking is um, there's quite a lot of um, misconceptions about stalking, so it's often associated with kind of celebrities, etc. Um, from our perspective, you know, we see that the majority of um, stalking victims are what you would consider, you know, people in living everyday lives. About 55% of people that call the National Stalking Helpline are stalked by their ex-partner. Uh, but 45% of those are not ex-partners, so they might be acquaintances, neighbours, colleagues, etc. So it's also really important for us that we are seen in um, both the connection to domestic abuse and the kind of effects that that has, but that there is also a whole contingent of victims who are not um, stalked by their ex-partners. And so in terms of service provision for victims, it's really important to recognise that because often the two domestic abuse and stalking are put together but that leaves a big gap in terms of um, victims services if, if they're only provided by people who are experts in domestic abuse um, so then coming back to kind of the kind of main points we have um, we were really um, pleased as well to see some of the nuances that rec that come about in terms of stalking. So the reasonableness um, clause for us is really key, particularly there are some cases where um, stalkers, uh, the extent of the stalking is not known to the victim. So an investigation might take place and, you know, a victim might report that this has happened, that there, there is some stalking behaviours going on. When the police investigate, there is actually far more... Um, stalking, you know, for example, it might be photos have been taken or more knowledge from the perpetrator's perspective about the victim and the victim knows. So that idea that it's also not based, that the, the not based entirely on the way the victim kind of um, rates their fear or distress is quite important, although we would always say that the victim impact is at the centre. Um, in terms of the, uh, I think it's subsection four, um, we really welcomed the inclusion of that list of behaviours. 
Um, but again, as we stated in our written, written evidence, it's really, really key that that is considered that that list is not considered to be exhaustive, and that something is included to say to state that um, stalking is something that evolves. Stalking behaviours evolve over time. You know, if you were thinking about twenty years ago, would we have ever imagined that the level of online behaviours of stalking would have been possible? But now, you know. During the pandemic, for example, you know, 100% of our victims that rang us had had experienced some form of online stalking now. Um, so it's really key that we make it clear that that list is not if it has to be one of those because we have to be ready for the evolution of stalking behaviours. And also the fact that, you know, stalkers will keep changing their behaviours, finding new ways to kind of get into their victims' lives. Um, and as, we, as I've talked about, in terms of the, the focus being on the impact of that behaviour, so rather than, again, you know, the sort of strict behaviour list is really key for us. Um, many campaigners and commenta commentators have sort of um, talked about the fact that it's the impact on the daily life of the victim that's paramount because the behaviours themselves are often not what you would consider um, to be particularly um, in some cases, you know, they don't appear to be threatening. So, for example, sending a bunch of flowers is not necessarily viewed as being particularly threatening, but in the context of stalking and the impact that has on the victim, that's the key to kind of understanding it. Um, but in terms of Clause 2, the recognition around the offence of threatening or abusive behaviour, the concern we have, we, we welcome the recognition around that offence, but the concern we have is that it not only applies to a single incident, but also then goes on to mention that it can be applied to a course of conduct. Um, this for us is something that could then start to cause a little bit of confusion between what's stalking and what's threatening or abusive behaviour. So within England and Wales, we see quite a lot of issues where um, between the difference between stalking and harassment um, and the sort of things being charged as harassment when really they're actually stalking. So for us, we would, we would probably suggest that that course of conduct element is taken out and kind of reviewed because the clarity in the law is, is, is going to is potentially going to cause some issues for those who actually have to implement it. Um, and then... Just in terms of kind of the the rest of the um, evidence that we submitted, um, we we welcome the introduction of SPOs, stalking protection orders. We do have them in England and Wales. Um, we are having some, uh, as with any new piece of legislation, what you would call teething problems. So getting the guidance right and working with providers around getting that guidance right is key. Um, so getting the threshold right, um, getting the idea around positive requirements right. For example, it's quite common to put in that people might have to a attend a perpetrator programme. But if you have no perpetrator programmes to refer to, it doesn't kind of make sense to have that as a positive intervention. So there's something about kind of investment that goes alongside it. Um, and then I think the other main point that we probably just wanted to kind of draw your attention to from our perspective is um, the financial implications, particularly around um, stalking protection orders. There was no kind of additional funds that were granted to the police when these were introduced. And as a result, we are now seeing that financial burden becoming a barrier to their implementation. So there is, a, because the police carry the costs of taking them to court. So there is something about um, kind of bearing that in mind when, when they're, they're sort of brought into being. Um, so I hope that's OK. I hope that kind of highlights the main points. OK, thank you. Uh, that is helpful. Just one of the points I wanted to pick up on, and then I'll bring in members. Um, there, there's some reference just to the stalking protection orders um, in terms of how they've been operating in, in England and Wales. Do you want to just elaborate on some of the, the concerns there that it's maybe not working out as, as was envisaged? And is there... a in your view, whilst anecdotal, that the police may, may go for the SPOs as their their preference over pursuing a, an offence in the courts? 
Um, so one of the key issues that we are now seeing um, some evidence of is that um, SPOs in uh, England and Wales have got the, have got a criminal threshold. And as um, kind of when we were looking to have these introduced, we always wanted them to have the civil threshold. Um, and so as a result, that, that's causing kind of problems because you've got exactly the same kind of evidence threshold required for an SPO as you do for an investigation, you know, and, and a criminal uh, charge of stalking. Um, and so that's, that's kind of one of the problems that's now happening because you're kind of seeing um, there have been instances, is, is it my understanding, where SPOs are going to, um, basically they're not meeting the criminal threshold and then as a result, the stalking charge is, no, is, is being seen as no longer able to be taken as well because the SPO threshold hasn't been met. So that's one kind of issue, is that the protection that they were supposed to offer is then actually acting against what the, the criminal charge is then, then gonna go on to do. Um, in, ter uh, in terms of um, the other kind of things we're seeing is breaches, you know, if they're not appropriately tackled, then the SPOs are, are not worth anything. Um, and, and that's one of the key things that we see with any kind of piece of legislation like this. If it's not, you know, if you don't follow up on a breach, then it becomes a pointless piece of, you know, protection for the victim. But those are the kind of main things we're seeing. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That's helpful. I'll bring in members at this stage. So Linda Dillon, please. Thank you, Chair, and thank you very much for your, your presentation. Just the, the last point that you made around the police and ar around um, the fact that they're not being properly resourced, and this is something that we, we did ask. Um, we had um, PSNA in last week before the committee, and we did ask around this particular issue. So we, we were very live to the to the fact that it, it could potentially happen. And I would like to think that it may well be less of an issue here because we have one police service. Um, it's potentially easier to monitor. And I'm just wondering, I mean, my thinking would be that that's exactly what, what is important here is that we monitor that that's not happening. <coughs> and if it is happening, then we need to come back, come back to this. This is, uh, after all, the Justice Minister is bringing forward this legislation. So the Justice Minister has a responsibility to resource it. Um, if we find that the PSNA are not properly resourced, I'm, I'm just wondering, are there any other things that we should be doing to ensure that that's not the case or anything we can put in place other than that monitoring piece and ensuring in the future that we follow up on the, the resourcing? Is there anything else that you'd be suggesting we should or could be doing? Um, one of the things that um, we are currently uh, have called for um, following some of the recent discussions in England and Wales is around a kind of task force approach actually around why stalking prosecutions are so low and then the convictions are even lower. So one of the things that it might be quite useful to sort of bring in from the start when this legislation or, you know, if this legislation comes in is to actually have something in place that monitors it almost straight away as well because it, it kind of then means from the get-go you're able to kind of see how successful it's being because... Unfortunately, as I sort of said at the beginning, it's great to have the legislation. You know, we've had it for a long time, but we still are seeing lots and lots of issues with the understanding of what it actually means and lots of victims who don't get the appropriate charge and the appropriate prosecution as a result. So that, that would probably be the kind of main one. Yeah, I appreciate that, Emma, and I think that has been a, a concern that, that has been outlined by other um, people who have come before the committee and it's a concern for the committee. It is something that we did add into the domestic abuse bill because that, that monitoring and reviewing is vital. And I think that I would potentially see that either the department will be listening and, and add it in or the, the committee will want to do that themselves. But I, I agree with you. Thank you very much. Um, Chair, that's that's really my, my only question for Emma. Thanks a million and I appreciate your presentation and you giving us the time today. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you, Linda. Um, can I bring in Rachel Woods and then Sinead Bradley in that order? Rachel. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Emma, for that. Um, 
Certainly on the disappointing terms of review and monitoring, um, she'll know where I stand on that, absolutely. Um, I just want to excuse my ignorance in terms of monitoring and reporting in England. Uh, do you have annual reporting on stopping statistics and offences, charges and prosecutions like that? So, um, my understanding was that we, we did at one point have um, some uh, stats that were coming through in terms of CPS data, that kind of thing. Um, but because of some of the problems with the data, um, they were going to do a review and kind of come out with the stats again, making sure they were potentially in a you know better position. Um, we do we send data in to the ONS, so we we provide data to the Office of National Statistics for um, part of the kind of victim survey type of thing about their own experiences, that kind of thing. We, so we do have some data there is annual sort of data but it's again it's one of those things you know when because obviously also when numbers get low it's also harder to publish some of the data so that's one of the things i think that they're also trying to work on is how we can get kind of um better stats okay thank you um no a lot of good data collection and statistics um more data you have and you, you know what's going on I suppose and then funding follows suit usually um, and I suppose on financial costs I know you'd covered it on the financial costs of the stock and protection orders which is a concern um, and even within the bill uh, that we have an explanatory financial memorandum you know where it's, it's going to be based on a outline business case you know there's no there's no funding attached to this mm -hmm. legislation and we'd heard last week an indicative cost to the police service in Northern Ireland without monitoring and other responsibilities of SPOs could be about eight hundred pounds each. Um, do you would you know how how what well, even anecdotally how much they're costing in in England? No, I don't know. I'm afraid. I mean, I can definitely find out and sort of see if there's any data that we can send send to you afterwards. That's something that you know we can definitely help out with. I'm sure. No, that's great. Thank you. Sorry, putting you on the spot on that. Oh, no, 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 I just, I don't want to pluck a finger out the air. You know, no, you're grand, you're grand. <laughs> um, lastly, just in terms of something that was in their submission, it was cla about Clause 8, Subsection 4, um, in relation to the impact on religious beliefs. Yes. Um, education in place of work. And you mentioned then a possibility of manipulation um, in that, and I certainly have some concerns just about this on a number of levels. Um, would you be able to maybe elaborate a wee bit more on that and some experiences of the people that you've dealt with? And my concern also is, um, and especially in our legislation um, as drafted, that has exceptionalities for workplace education or religious setting, but what if the stalking behaviour is occurring at the workplace, yeah. education place or religious setting? Um, and, and, and how maybe you've squared that circle, if, if, if you have, in England and, and, and if, if that's something that you do come across? And um, so the, we, this is contained, this was also contained within our guidance and on SPOs and we raise exactly the same concern um, at that point. Um, I think what you're obviously kind of seeing here is balancing the, the rights of the perpetrator with the rights of the victim. But we know from the victim's perspective that workplaces are often quite a key place for someone to stalk because they can guarantee that the person will be there at a certain place, you know, at certain times. So I guess for, from our perspective, this is where the kind of training for the judiciary, et cetera, and kind of when you are putting together an SPO would be key, because if that is the case that, you know, the place that there's been a lot of stalking around those places or could be, then you would hope that the SPO would be written in such a way that, yes, okay, we recognize that the perpetrator has a right to continue their daily life, but actually it's not appropriate for them to be in that area because that's one of the key places that they would be, you know, undertaking the stalking in. So that's why we, we sort of keep saying it, but the training of, of the judiciary to understand some of these issues and the nature of stalking is really key because so many people have kind of a complete misconception of what stalking is. They see it as someone kind of hiding in a bush or you know, those kinds of things, you know, how, how does someone find out where you work, you know, how, all those sorts of things, it's like, because that's, that's their fixation, that, that's what they want to know, they, they want to, you know, be where you are, they want to disrupt your life, so, yeah, that, that would be our suggestion, kind of get some really good training in, so that the judiciary understands you're not actually, you're not working against the rights of the perpetrator, you're just balancing them with the rights of the victim in this case.
Thank you, Emma. Couldn't agree more with you. Um, appreciate that. Uh, thank you, Chair. Well, thank you, Rachel. I'm Sinead Bradley, and then I'll bring in Paul. Sinead. Thanks, Chair, and Emma, thank you for your presentation and your submission. Um, I won't go over some of the things that have been discussed, but if I could take you back to the piece in your um, presentation about Clause 2 and yep. the proposal for the removal of a course of conduct. Yep. So if I'm following your logic correctly, that's to eliminate the chances of cases, more cases than need to, going under this offence than the stalking offence. Yeah. And I'm wondering, uh, with that in mind, um, is that do you recognise that there may be a potential difficulty with the burden of proof? Is that maybe something that that maybe has that in there? And also, um, should that, and I also put, I, I recognise you're talking about the behaviours and I think distressful, uh, the distress part to get that. But also then following that through, if that removal was to come about, would you anticipate then, given you're taking out um, a course of conduct and only leaving in a single act, would you then imagine the conviction piece in that clause two would also have to be revisited because that would reduce probably the level of crime that may have been perpetrated? Thank you. So, so for us, one of the biggest issues we see is the misunderstanding of what stalking is and therefore as a result it's often not recognised and charged appropriately and so often someone will be charged with a, what you would consider a lesser offence. And so the, that was our concern when we read this, is that by including that last course of conduct element, mm -hmm. that if you're not quite understanding stalking and you haven't got your kind of, the, the, your thought around so is it is it really is it really severe alarm and distress for the victim etc or is it you know what it it's almost like the default then position might be that you start to see quite a big increase in your threatening and abusive behaviors because it feels like well it's not quite the same you know it, it's not quite that that same level we, we can't how do you prove the difference um because you know one one bit that I put in the evidence is also around the fact that you know it's quite unusual for us to see courses of conduct where there isn't serious distress so to kind of try and differentiate to say well there's a course of conduct that has got serious distress and there's a course of conduct that hasn't got serious distress would have you know how do you kind of pitch that so we'd always be saying you know really it's just it's stalking if there's a course of conduct, it's stalking because there's generally serious distress involved, you know, in some way, and it's impacting on that victim's life normally quite substantially. Um, and what was the second part you were saying about the, the sentencing? Yeah, yeah so it's the, yeah, it's the downgrading, so you're trying to eliminate the possibility of the downgrading of the offence. Yeah. And then then if, if that then left a smaller margin, so it's a single act only that would come under clause two, do you then think it would follow through that we would have to revisit the um, the convictions under that clause too? Um, I guess it's probably difficult for me to say exactly whether or not because it would depend on what would be charged under or what what could fall under that. Um, and I guess the, the the other thing is around having this the this offence sort of just kind of thinking about it is that. You, you do want to ensure that the course of conduct is recognised. So there is still a danger that with the single offence, you could just get lots of individual, what is amounts to stalking, being charged as individual offences of threatening or abusive behaviour. So again, that might be something that you would want to monitor regardless to see how the two interplay with each other. Um, in terms of the downgrading of the actual kind of sentence, it's I wouldn't want to necessarily make a, a kind of... Um, statement about that without kind of really understanding what it is that we would envisage would be um, charged under that offence. Um, but, but for us, you know, it's, it's really clear that there's got to be work done so that the course of conduct is recognised. That in, um, Too often we see incidents being seen as single incidents on their own. Um, and but then once there is a course of conduct that it's it's recognized as stalking it's not seen as something else and i think that's what we're sort of trying to avoid with this kind of you know slight overlap i hope that's helpful 
Yeah, it is. It is. I, I absolutely follow your logic in that. So it is about recognizing if there is a course of conduct, it is stopping. Yes. <laughs> and, and it shouldn't be framed anywhere else other yeah. than up to the stalking um, conviction piece. So, yes, but I'm just wondering then what that leaves because it, I suppose this is almost an insurance piece in the legislation that if for whatever reason the conviction wasn't, uh, couldn't be brought, that there is something else there. Um, so I need to understand better that, yeah, that yeah. thing that, but I appreciate that it's a very, it's a very, um, worthwhile submission. Thank you, Emma. That was very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sinead. Paul Free. Yeah, just on that that, that, that strikes me, that conversation you've just had there with Sinead is, is very striking in that the fact is that I can't think of a course of conduct uh, that's attached or uh, exemplifies stalking that you shouldn't be or couldn't be encapsulated in Clause 1. So, so I struggle with this, and I, I think we're, what has happened here is that Clause 2 is, uh, for want of a better phrase, a copy and paste job uh, from Scottish legislation into this to try and cover, cover all angles. And I'm not sure that it does its job properly uh, and could then do violence to the whole bill. Is that a fair, is that a fair reflection that I've just gave there? Or a, or a concern that you maybe would share? Um, I, as a, I, I think in our submission, you know, we, we welcome that the recognition of that offence if it's got value. If there are, you know, if we are lucky enough to, the, the victim rings up for the first, the, for, the, for, the, for the first time they're, you know, um, victimized and you know they, they are able to get a, some form of criminal sanction against the perpetrator for threatening or abusive behavior but what we know is that generally when um, victims do make contact with the criminal justice system that they're already there is already a course of conduct so it's not necessarily that we would say kind of it's there's no value in it and it might be that things are able to be prosecuted underneath it that, you know, that I kind of off the top of my head, I'm not able to kind of um, think of right now. But for me, it, I, I, I agree with you in terms of the course of conduct stuff for us is, is significant. And, you know, by the time victims generally make contact, the course of conduct is well established. So it, it wouldn't be for me to say that there is not necessarily space for that offence of threatening or abusive behaviour, but our concern is that we too often see, particularly as I say in England and Wales, that things are, you know, they're, they're charged as harassment rather than stalking because we have this kind of overlap between the two offences. So um, you could leave a gap, but at the same time, you may not, you may just kind of get people to actually charge stalking when it's there. Yeah, so, so I get that, and that's why we've been pushing for stalking legislation, because we use, over here, harassment reg legislation, yeah. which is nothing at all compatible with uh, the activity of stalking, and, and, and you know we've, we've fought hard against that so that we've got a stalking bill. But the, to me, clause to the offence of threatening or abusive behaviour is already encapsulated in law probably many times, uh, including the Offences Against the Persons Act. So if this bill is designed to tackle stalking behaviour, I'm still not convinced that Clause 2 is required and then that there could be a danger that within this legislation when people are charged that they do end up dropping down to a lesser charge that's contained within the bill. Uh, and that's something that concerns me at this stage. Um, uh, and again, it might it might be the case that we remove a course of conduct line uh, and keep it just a single act, but then I don't know if that's what it's designed to do. Uh, so that's something that, that concerns me. Can I ask, just when you talk about Clause 1 and you're happy to see the list of uh, conducts or, or lists of yeah. activities, uh, and yes, it is good to get that definition and that itemised uh, activity. I agree with that. Have you any concerns around, um, and I don't know if you've got it in front of you, the detail, but for, uh, f subsection 4J, where 
And I'll read it out. Acting in any other way that a reasonable person or a reasonable person who has any particular knowledge of B that A has would expect would cause B to suffer fear, alarm or substantial distress. And I read that all out in its totality, but I'm really concerned. The question is around, is it, is it clear to you that reasonableness only really activates itself when one is acting in any other way? So is, is that the catch-all that you require? And, and if it is, is it clear that reasonableness only really kicks in in any other way and not the activities found in 4A to A? Um, so the, the way I um, we've looked at it is so there's a reasonable there's a reasonable I can't say the word reasonableness yeah there's a reasonableness clause that comes under um, one one b two yes I believe it says the person commits an offence where it's such that a reasonable person so for us the impact on the victim. Um, is the key element of this. So it's about where somebody else would basically say that's that's not that's not a reasonable kind of behaviour or that you know that isn't that isn't kind of normal type of thing. Okay. Um, in terms of the list of behaviours, what we would like to see added is something along the lines of this list is not exhaustive. This isn't a the the only you know the only kind of things that you could um, you could have. So if you are saying, does Jay do the catch-all that we would require? I would say, no, it doesn't. We would want something that says, you know, um, this list of behaviours is not exhaustive. We have that written into our guidance. Um, so, yeah. so, 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 so it's sort of, that's the catch-all we have where it basically says, this is the list, but actually this list isn't, this isn't the, you know, the only things you could have. So I get that being put into guidance, but is it yeah. really appropriate to put it into uh, legislation whereby basically you're saying this list isn't exhaustive and it could be anything else. Uh, would that be good law? I'm not a lawyer, so I wouldn't necessarily say that I could advise exactly on the status of that. Um, I think probably from our perspective, we would just like to make sure it's clear somewhere and i'm sure there's a, an argument to say that it doesn't make any sense if you put it actually within the legislation um but there's probably an argument to say that it could be um I'm, i can't i'm yeah i can't be kind of more specific no that, i understand <laughs> i understand uh, uh subsection four in clause one uh talks about conduct means uh and i go to four b uh, contacting or attempting to contact B or any other person by any means. Now, I have I've put a footnote beside this here to say, does this include online? Now, I know there is, a, uh, there is a section on the internet, which is D, but does, but does that help contacting or attempting to contact B or any other person by any means? So, if technology moves on, uh, is, that f is that clause 4B... Is that, or sorry, 14B, is that future, future proofed when it says by any means? Um, that, that could be, but again, if, I guess if you were looking at it in down to the letter of the law, because it talks about contacting by any means, it, you could potentially, I guess, see a situation where someone says they weren't trying to contact. Yep. They were just trying to gift or they were just trying to, you, do, do you see what I mean? So. Yep. The any other means is good in that in that um, sentence, but I guess if someone was then trying to kind of look at the law and how it was applied, if you were looking at that specifically, you would say that oh, the only other means only applies to contacting, and then you would potentially get into a debate around what contact actually entails. Yep. So, so to go back then to your exhaustive list, uh, and and I would rather see a list that's more detailed and itemised. One activity that I think that I'm considering should be considered in this is, is the makeup of what I would describe as a picture wall. There's probably a more police nuanced term or scientific term, psychological term to use, but you know what I mean, where, where somebody is so obsessed with a person that they basically take over yes. a room of their house with pictures of that person. 
Now, to me, that's not natural behaviour. Uh, 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 it's quite, to me, quite dangerous behaviour. But should that be included? Should something like that, where the, where there's not actually a contact between A and B, but but the perpetrator is actually doing something, in in without the victim knowing about it, which is basically gathering photographs and displaying them on a wall, should that be? Well, I know it's cause for concern, but should that be actually articulated in the bill? And if so, is there any other activities that should be included? Uh, we, so again, kind of, that's kind of where we were talking about that first reasonableness clause coming in, because in those situations, as I sort of put, um, pertain to in the beginning of the conversation, the victim might not actually even know the extent yeah. to which they're being monitored. So it's that first part for us is key. It's about um, thinking through what a reasonable person would see as opposed to always, you know, thinking, because um, if the victim doesn't know, the victim may not, as I say, feel fear, distress, etc. cetera. Um, I think we, in terms of the list of behaviors, we kind of look at this a lot and sort of think is there value in adding more behaviors or you know could could we see things i think the law the, the list would just go on and on and on if we looked at every single type of stalking behavior because there's not you know the, the most common ones are probably the ones that are captured here it's the kind of contacting um you know monitoring behavior loitering etc they're the kind of most common ones watching and spying that kind of thing um if we tried to capture everything as i say i think the list would just keep going and the other thing is um we don't want to provide a framework for stalkers if that makes sense yeah. We don't want to provide a list, and that's why we 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 like the open-ended nature of the list, because stalkers will always think of something that we've never seen or thought about before, and so it's quite useful for us to have that kind of open-ended, but also not to list everything. We don't necessarily want to kind of provide ideas as well. Okay, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Well, I think that's all the members at this stage that are wanting to ask questions um, before we move on to the last session. So, Emma, can I thank you very much for taking the time to join the committee today? It's been very much appreciated and very helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Emma. Pleasure. Okay, members, we'll move on to the final oral evidence session. And uh, hopefully we're, we're joined um, by three witnesses. Yes, thank you. So we've... Ailing uh, Twomey, Policy and Advocacy Officer of the Rainbow Project, Amanda McGurk from the Domestic Violence Support Worker, Cara Friend and Daniel, uh, Danielle Roberts, the Policy Development Officer for Here and I. Um, so you're all very welcome to the meeting. Thank you for joining with us, members. The submission uh, for the evidence on this one is pages 31 to 43. Um, we will record this one again by Hansard and publish... Um, the account of it on our committee web page. So I'm going to hand over to yourselves at this stage to give us a brief outline of any of the key issues and then members we can pick it up with some questions. So thank you. Thank you very much Chair. Um, we are going to take it in order of Danielle, Amanda and then myself. Okay, thank you. Danielle. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you to the committee for the invitation today to speak about the Protection from Stalking Bill. Um, here and I advocates for and supports lesbian and bisexual women and their families and aims to improve the lives of lesbian and bisexual women across Northern Ireland. Uh, we're the only women-focused organisation within the LGBTQ sector. We jointly run a gendered violence project with Cara Friend, which is aimed at LGBTQ plus women and girls aged 12 plus who are at risk of domestic and sexual violence or abuse. And my colleague Amanda is the gender violence worker and she'll speak about some of the experiences of the girls and women that she has supported who have experienced stalking and harassment. In developing our written response, we work closely with Women's Aid and the Women's Policy Group and some of our service users participated in the Raise Your Voice survey, which the Women's Policy Group written response draws on. Stalking can form part of a pattern of domestic abuse, harassment, hate crime, sexual violence, or a mixture of these categories. 
As the committee has already heard from Women's Aid, stocking can take place online as well as in physical spaces, including the home, workplace and social locations. Stocking is a serious offence in itself, but often includes other crimes such as criminal damage and physical violence. There's also a correlation between stocking and domestic homicide. Protection from stocking is a human rights issue. Stocking can cause a victim to live in constant fear, as well as interfering with their right to work, education and private and family life. One of the issues we'd like to highlight is that we don't actually know the levels of um, stocking that takes place within LGBTQ plus relationships. We don't have dis disaggregated data on a local level and we have no way of knowing what unreported experiences there are. From evidence elsewhere, which is included in our written response, we know reports of stalking, harassment and violence, violent assault in the LGBTQ plus community have increased dramatically in England and Wales in recent years, and this is in line with our professional experience here. In several countries, including UK-wide studies and in the US and Canada, studies have shown that bisexual women in particular are the most vulnerable to rape, sexual assault, domestic violence and stalking. And a 2010 to 2012 study in the US found that bisexual women experience stalking at higher levels than any other group. A more recent study from 2019 found disproportionately high levels of bisexual women experience stalking or other crime carried out by an intimate partner over their lifetimes. 61% of bisexual women reported being raped, assaulted or stalked by an intimate partner compared to 44% of lesbian women and 35% of heterosexual women. Amanda and Ashling will discuss some of the barriers to accessing support services. And while there are barriers, there are also examples of best practice which can be drawn on. But first, we need to get a fuller picture of the level of stalking offences happening in general, as well as in relation to particular groups to ensure services are adequately resourced. We recommend that all Section 75 groups should be monitored where stalking offences are perpetrated, with both the perpetrator and victim um, data being recorded. They should be inclusive of sexual orientation and gender identity. We would recommend monitoring sexual orientation and gender identity made a standard procedure, as this removes the onus on the individual to come out in an environment where they're not sure they'll be welcomed. Everyone has a sexual orientation and gender identity, and we need to stop othering those who are not heterosexual and are cisgendered, that is, their gender matches the, that assigned at birth. We'd also recommend that policies and procedures are co-designed with representatives of Section 75 groups as specialists and experts to ensure that there are no oversights, for example, even when recorded, bisexual people are also often misrecorded based on the gender of their current partner. To date, there's been very little acknowledgement in policy or legislation of LGBTQ plus people who've experienced stalking, and so we particularly welcome the opportunity to give evidence today. As any new legislation is rolled out, there should be mandatory training for judges together with the PPS, police and other legal professionals on best practice, such as using gender neutral pronouns and sexual orientation awareness. We would also like uh, to see LGBTQ plus domestic violence liaison police officers and specialist independent domestic violence advocates. We welcome the protection of stalking bill and a proposed stalking offence. However, we also recognise it's only one element of fighting gender-based violence. For example, there are already many issues in relation to current breaches of non-molestation orders within Northern Ireland and people not being taken seriously by the police when they report this makes victims and survivors lose faith in the system, as Amanda will discuss. These issues need to be addressed. Here and I also advocates for the urgent implementation of a standardised RSE curriculum across every school in Northern Ireland so that people can learn what a healthy relationship is and help them identify if they're at risk. So thank you for listening and I'll now pass to Amanda. Thank you, Danielle. Amanda? Thank you, Chair, and the Justice Committee for the invitation and the opportunity to come along today and talk about the protection from the stalking bill here in Northern Ireland. My name is Amanda McGurk and I am the Joint Domestic Violence Support Worker in two organisations within the LGBT sector. They are Cara Friend and Here and I. Cara Friend have been supporting LGBTQ plus community since 1974 and work with 12 to 25 year olds in a range of areas, including the Domestic Violence Project. Here and I, as Danielle has already explained, are an organisation that supports lesbian, bisexual women and their families. I am here today to have some of the women and girls I work with voices in the LGBTQ plus 
community voices heard. I'm going to give a real life example of stalking experienced by an LGBTQ plus person. Explain the barriers that LGBTQ plus people face in reporting stalking and the issue of invisibility and heteronormativity. Firstly, we welcome the new legislation. Um, as the legislation is currently in place is no longer fit for purpose. We've seen that in more recent years, the use of technology against victims is a lot more apparent and that current legislation doesn't go far enough to cover this. Much like the aspects of technology, as soon as you get the latest piece of equipment, it's out of date. Perpetrators, as soon as new legislation comes out into effect, they find a way to work around it. So leg legislation is outdated before it's made lawful. We are concerned that there is no better way of dealing with malicious communications and cyberbullying and stalking, but my colleague Ashley will talk more about this later. When we talk about stalking, people often see it as a stranger who is in a possession with someone or is caused by mental health issues. However, within the LGBTQ plus organisations that I work for, I see a correlation between stalking and domestic abuse. I'll now give an example of this. Um, a lot of women and girls that I engage with have experienced domestic abuse or sexual violence and abuse. Describe what I can only, la only label as stalking and harassment. However, when describing these experiences, they don't la label them as stalking or harassment. They label them as just other things that happen to them. This shows there's a lack of education and awareness surrounding stalking within the LGBTQ plus community. And if we want to resolve this, and encourage people to see stalking as an issue and report it, then we need have to have a robust campaign highlighting stopping st stopping stalking within the LGBTQ plus community. An example of this is where I was working with a woman whose ex-partner had been abusive towards him. Throughout her story, she told me that her ex-partner, after they had separated, started appearing everywhere she went. If she was at her sister's house, her ex would turn up there. If she was at her holiday home, her ex would turn up there. And my client explained that she couldn't understand how her ex knew exactly where she was and when she would be there. On hearing this, I asked the client if they knew about the location services on her phone and also about the map that shows up in Snapchat. Um, also on her phone, I explained that these can be disabled, but they must be disabled on all phones in the household, including their children's phones. My client contacted me a couple of days later and said that she'd worked out that her ex was able to follow her everywhere she went as they were finding her using the maps on her child's Snapchat. At no point did the client describe this as stalking. She just viewed this as another way her ex was able to harass her. With the changes in technology advancing faster than definitely my broadband because um, yeah, it's really slow, um, it's imperative that the legislation is robust enough and flexible enough to adapt to the ever change of technology and technological advances that move at a, a high speed. There's a lack of research into stalking within the LGBTQ plus community. Um, I'm sure Danielle mentioned that earlier. Um, and there, there are no statistics showing stalking as a standalone issue. It is only ever mentioned within hate crime. However, in the five years between 2013-14 and 2017-2018, the number of homophobic and transphobic hate crimes has doubled in England and Wales from 4,600 to 11,600. These crimes include stalking and violent assault within the LGBTQ plus community. There needs to be specific data collected around stalking and abuse within the LGBTQ plus community. If if there is no data collected in these cases, there is an impression that there are very low numbers of domestic abuse and harassment within same-sex relationships. When we talk about barriers or perceived barriers, these there are some specific ones for those people from the LGBTQ plus community. The first barrier an LGBT person has to overcome is that they will have to disclose their sexual orientation or gender identity, otherwise known as coming out. And they effectively have to do this to make the report, report. This alone can prevent an LGBT person reporting crime that has happened against them. Not everybody is confident enough to be able to 
out themselves or disclose their sexual orientation to people they don't know. This can be because of the perceived fear of homophobia, biphobia or transphobia. A fear of the reaction that someone who is not from the LGBTQ plus community may have at the disclosure of someone's sexual orientation or gender, gender identity. Many individuals have to think, how is this person going to react? Is this going to affect my living circumstances? I.e., am I going to become homeless? Or what are the consequences of me disclosing my sexual orientation? Many LGBTQ plus individuals report they've had a negative reaction to them disclosing their sexual orientation or gender identity when accessing services. Heteronormativity and making assumptions. The majority of campaigns that we see in the media are centred around heterosexual, white, cisgendered, those who identify with the gender they were assigned at birth, um, or the opposite of transgender, people, and rarely show the diversity of our society. Identifying as a sexual orientation that deviates from heteronormativity may lead to violence and emotional abuse. However, if an LGBTQ plus person also identifies within another minority grouping, they may experience even more discrimination. Intersectionality refers to particular forms of intersection, intersecting oppressions, for example, intersections of race, gender or sexuality and nation. Intersectionality, for example, helps us understand the overlapping of many identities such as ethnicity, socioeconomic status, sexual orientation or gender identity, to name a few. Regarding LG LGBTQ plus people, quite often intersectionality is minimalised or not taken into account. Rarely there are no indicators of difference between LGBTQ plus people. There is always a danger where those placed in one category may be seen as a homogenous group and the diversity and differences within this group are lost. If you're a woman and it is often assumed then your partner will be a man, this is heteronormativity where heterosexuality is classed as a default. Heteronormative campaigns often make the LGBTQ plus community invisible. For people from the LGBTQ plus community there is assumption that stalking only happens to heterosexual people and it doesn't exist in same-sex relationships. Often public awareness campaigns focus on a female victim and a male perpetrator in a heterosexual relationship. This is a barrier for LGBTQ plus people, not only in reporting all forms of abuse, but also even recognising what they are experiencing as abuse. Visibility is extremely important for minority communities. When minority communities are included in public campaigns, then there is a shift in social consciousness to be more inclusive. As part of the collective <clears throat> women's policy group response to the call for evidence, the organisations collectively sent out a survey monkey on the 30th of March and closed on the 13th of April 2021 to women who had experienced stalking to ensure the voices of victims were heard. 18% of these people who answered the survey identified as LGBTQ+. For these people, many of them have never seen themselves reflected in media campaigns. Therefore, they may have never recognised that what they were experiencing was stopping until speaking to someone who names it as such. Effective and inclusive public awareness campaigns are so important. Often public awareness campaigns focus on a woman and a man in a heterosexual relationship. Aware, um, public awareness campaigns, legislation and awareness training for statutory community and voluntary sector organisations must recognise there are multiple circumstances domestic abuse occurs whenever and beyond a heterosexual relationship. We very much welcome the new legislation, but the legislation alone is not sufficient. Legislat legislative advances should be supported with mandatory training on best practice, as Danielle had said. Um, awareness campaigns using gender neutral pronouns gender neutral language should be used in relation to the victim and perpetrator. The use of gender pronouns in describing the victim and perpetrator's risk alienating the LGBTQ plus community and lead to an assumption that they're not included in services. Using terms such as perpetrator and victim avoids this. In addition, 
specifically identifying LGBTQ plus in a public awareness campaigns means LGBTQ plus people will be more likely to engage with services. The use of gender pronouns in describing victims and perpetrators by service providers risks sorry, adequate funding should also be made available for full implementation of any legislative advances. This funding should also be made for the LGBTQ sector organisations who have the expertise to carry out this work. I'd like to th thank you for taking the time to listen to me today, today and I'll let you move on to Ashling. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Ashling. Thank you, Chair. Um, I welcome the opportunity to provide some comment and information in regards to the legislation for the Protection of Stalking Bill. In the course of our work, we are supporting LGBT people who have experience of harassment or stalking, and often this can be in conjunction with other elements of crime, such as domestic abuse, sexual violence or hate crime. Amanda and Danielle have pointed out some of the sort of key barriers that exist for LGBT people when it comes to access and support. But there were just a few additional points I would like to, to raise. Um, firstly, I want to thank the Minister, her department and the committee for taking the time um, to welcome us in to present evidence from our community community, but also making sure that victims are at the very heart of all the legislation that's going forward. And I want to spe uh, say a special thank you to Christine and her staff for accepting my late submission on the evidence presented. Uh, we welcome uh, the introduction of a specific offence in regards to stalking that addresses the course of conduct and behaviour associated with stalking. Currently, our legislation is falling short of protecting people who are vulnerable to this type of criminal behaviour. Uh, the current protection that we have under the Harassment 1997 law uh, has been underused and is a, isn't being sufficiently used to reflect the seriousness of stalking. As Amanda has said, we don't really have a true reflection of what the experiences are for LGBT people in Northern Ireland. Um, over the last year, uh, we have been working with the PSNI in regards to the domestic abuse legislation and training and awareness packaging, um, because LGBT people have been invisible when it comes to policy and to legislation. So we have welcomed the kind of gender, uh, the, the gender neutral element to the domestic abuse legislation. And we would like to see that reflected going forward. As Amanda has pointed out, it is a barrier to people access and support. We welcome the introduction of the stalking uh, prevention orders um, and we welcome the fact that the offence of stalking is not um, exhaustive and is inclusive. Uh, we believe that the victim uh, should be focus of all legislation. Uh, we would ask that, that a perception test is applied to the offence in regards to the, the thoughts and feelings of the victim who is experiencing the stalking in conjunction with the relationship or lack thereof uh, between the stalker and the victim. Uh, just to give a kind of Northern Ireland flavour in regards to the serious issue in regards to underreporting of hate crime, the Rainbow Project and the Police Service of Northern Ireland and the Department of Justice work in conjunction with the Advocacy Service, which works to tackle the level of underreporting of hate crime. Um, our own research has shown about 64% of crime goes underreported uh, in Northern Ireland. But over the last year, and given the difficulties that we've had around COVID, we've actually seen a 30% increase in terms of uh, homophobic hate crime being reported to the police and a 28% increase in terms of transphobic hate crime. A report conducted by the PSNI um, looking at a period of time last year from April to June actually showed there was about 130 incidences where more than one hate motivations was actually attached to that reporting. Um, and under that incident, harassment was listed and predominantly those were malicious communications targeted towards gay men, so gay, bi or trans men. So staffing and harass harassing behaviour are key issues for our community. As Danielle has pointed out, bisexual uh, people um, are more likely to experience crime, but LGBT people uh, across the UK have been shown to be more likely to be a victim of crime and would show a higher anxiety of experiencing crime. And certainly our own research has shown that up to 70% of people will change their behaviour um, for fear of being uh, a victim of crime. Whilst women are more um, statistically more likely to be stalked, it is also the fact that men are victims of stalking. 
And it's important to note that men specifically can, can struggle to be recognised as victims under gendered laws. Uh, studies have shown that sometimes when the perpetrator was male and the victim was female, their uh, allegations were treated more seriously. Most responses in regards to stalking that we've had with clients is advising them about obtaining non-molestation orders or civil injunctions. However, uh, we find in some cases the breaches of these orders are not being dealt with appropriately. So many of our victims are left feeling that they're not protected from stalkers or from harassment. Um, I know that there's been research which shows that over 60% of restraining or non-molestation orders are violated by the perpetrator. So as part of the legislation, we would like to see swift and firm action on any breaches of uh, the, the SPOs. Um, we welcome the induction or uh, the inclusion of cyber stalking within the scope of the legislation. This has been a concern for us over the last year, and the legislation really needs to have flexibility in order to adapt to the ever-changing technological world that we live in. Uh, whilst online communication is currently covered under the, the Malicious Communications Act, it isn't fully being affected to its, its full use and it doesn't cover the range of tools or social media aspects that people are using to abuse people. You know, digital harassment and abuse has become a big, big issue. Uh, Cybercrime, when we look at the PSNI statistics released in February of this year, there's been a 135% increase on the year before that. So that's a really significant increase. And within that, a high proportion of those would be either threats to kill or harassment. And again, the stats again are more towards women, uh, but men do feature within that. Um, over the last year with the Rainbow Project, we have actually seen a number of men being targeted through apps such as Grindr um, and social media, uh, where they have been targeted. Um, their abusers are able to set up many, many anonymous profiles in order to continue that abuse. Um, people have not been able to block them on those systems because they're constantly recreating another profile. So we need to see better involvement uh, with social media providers, with our internet providers, in terms of identifying those IP addresses connected to those offenders and that the police are able to get further information in order to establish the identity of those people who are continuing to perpetrate that level of abuse. We're also seeing an increase in image-based abuse. Um, victims that I have worked with have expressed symptoms around depression, anxiety, uh, and in some cases, suicidal um, tendencies and ideation. Um, internet users who identify as LGBTQ are more likely uh, to experience threats um, or non-consensual imaging being shared. But again, the main body of work when it looks at image-based abuse is solely focused on cis women. Um, um, so that, that's another area where LGBT experiences are not truly being reflected. We're seeing people who are living with HIV being targeted through uh, social media uh, and dating apps where people who have come out publicly to speak about their status are being harassed again uh, through these you know, anonymous social media accounts um, that are being able to be closed down and set up under a new name um, and just continue in that abuse. And the police have very, very difficult task in trying to identify that and trying to stop that. The one thing I also wanted to point out that that, that I know a previous person had, had brought up in, in evidence is the lack of intermediates being in the legislation. Um, the reason that I bring this up is that I actually worked with a case this year where um, the abuse had been going on with a child. So the child was over 18, was living out of the home, uh, but it had been an abusive transphobic house environment. That young person had left and got uh, accommodation elsewhere, but the mother who was the abuser in that situation was trying to maintain that contact uh, under the, the disguise of being welfare checks. She then got other family members to do the same, uh, but again, it was all about her continuing that uh, course of conduct um, and abuse towards their, their person. So even though that was an adult person living independently, had clearly demonstrated that they didn't wish to have contact with this person or anybody associated with the family, the 
the issues were not recognised by the police at that time. They weren't recognised as harassment because it was just another family member just trying to uh, take them out, you know, under the COVID regulations in terms of welfare. Uh, but actually, it was just to continue that abuse. It's clear, as Amanda pointed out, there are many barriers that exist for LGBTQI people. We aren't reflected in legislation. We aren't reflected in awareness campaigns. For many men who experience um, stalking harassment, uh, when they go to report it, oftentimes they can be um, minimized in their experiences or it's not taken as seriously uh, when they report that. So we really need to tackle that, and that can only be done by uh, greater awareness training, investment into uh, the, the research for the LGBT community, uh, and like Danielle said, uh, working in, in conjunction with LGBT organisations to co-design any work going forward. We really need to challenge the myths and stereotypes that are out there when it regards to victims. Um, often male victims are dealing with very negative male uh, stereotypes when it comes to gender in terms of masculinity. Um, for those who are from the LGBT community, there are further stereotypes that are attached to them, uh, which makes it even difficult for them to come forward to report uh, uh, abuse or stalking or harassment. So in closing, I just want to say, um, like Amanda said, whilst we stress, uh, stress that the legislation alone will not improve, uh, the experience for LGBT people. Changes can happen um, if it's done with research, investment and awareness campaigns done in conjunction with specialist LGBT services and that all victims must be offered that specialist support from an LGBT organisation as an advocate and that they are, and they are provided special measures uh, when it comes to moving through the criminal justice system. Uh, and I'll leave it there. I'm very happy for any questions. Okay, thank you, and, and thank you. That's been a very comprehensive um, briefing that you've provided from, from all three of you. I'm just going to pick up on, on one issue that Ashley and you, you just mentioned, and that was that growing social media um, form of harassment. I suppose the, the question is, what what more could be done on that that could strengthen you know, the protections for people that they're not faced with that level of harassment? Um, so it's a broad, <laughs> a broad question what, and what can be done. I think there's greater work and greater um, responsibility that needs to be taken by social media providers, by organisations that host um, dating websites, Facebook, Twitter, uh, that they have a responsibility in tackling hate. You know, Ofcom has shown that, you know, nearly 50% of people have a have viewed sort of hateful con you know, content online or have experienced harassment through it. Uh, whilst some social media organizations pay a bit of lip service to tackling that, uh, we actually need to see the follow through from them. Um, and I know that there's been discussions in regards to hate crime uh, and Ofcom in the UK in regards to holding those companies uh, to account. For, for not taking action on it. Um, I believe that there is a way in regards to if we know that an offender is a repeat offender when it comes to this issue, uh, everybody has a identifiable uh, IP address. I will be using an IP address as I call into this meeting today. That can be secured, that can be regulated, that could be blocked uh, to stop them accessing uh, the internet in order to continue that abuse. Um, we've seen it with, with non-molestation orders and things like that. So I think there is opportunity for us to um, bring that in under that legislation. Um, okay, no, thank you. Thank you, that is helpful. Okay, let me bring in some members now just at this stage. So I'll start with uh, Linda Dillon and then I'll go to Rachel. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to all three of you, to Amanda, Ashley, and Danielle. Appreciate your your contributions. Just a, a very quick question. Obviously, you've outlined the concerns around the lack of reporting, and that's largely, in many cases, due to the fear of homophobia from the professionals. Um, and the first barrier to an individual is that face-to-face -face having to disclose your sexual orientation or your gender identity. And I'm just wondering, how can that be overcome in a sensitive 
in a sensitive manner and, and an appropriate manner. In, in terms of the fact that obviously data collection and you've outlined this as well is so important because if we're not collecting the data and, and to be fair in terms of stalking we're not collecting the data in relation to anybody because we don't have the, the offence unfortunately yet but um, obviously going forward we're going to have it and how we're going to collect the data that will specifically identify the challenges for people from the LGBTQI community um, if you know if, if, if the challenge is immediately even and 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 forcing them to disclose that. So I, I'm I'm trying to get get my head around that. I know it has even been an issue that the PSNA have raised before around people from different um, religious or political backgrounds. You know that how do they identify that without specifically asking them and then asking them can create its own problems. So I'm just wondering how is is there a way that that can be done in a in a, in a sensitive manner. Can I take that one? Yeah. Sorry, I start that one off. Um, if nobody else minds. Uh, Thanks. So, um, I suppose the easiest way of doing it is asking the question, and I think um, we ask so many questions that are really, really personal, and we have no problem asking them, like your uh, your name, your address, your telephone number, your date of birth. Those are all very personal questions. What are you know? If somebody goes name, address, telephone number, sexual orientation, gender identity in the same way, rather than stuttering and, and being awkward about it, that first of all overcomes it. Secondly, if you're asking those questions to somebody from the LGBTQ plus community, that immediately says we are inclusive, we're affirming. So, so straight away, um, there are subtle, subtle ways of doing that. You know, um, you know, if there's a, a sticker on the police, the person's notebook, an LGBT, you know, rainbow flag, trans flag, um, a lanyard, anything like that that says I'm LGBT affirming, that instantaneously makes somebody feel a lot more easier about coming out and the reaction that they're going to have. So it's it's not um, it's not a massive thing that has to be done. It's very very subtle um, things that are, are put in place, or somebody having a sticker or a lanyard that, that says you're affirming. Therefore, people, you know, if somebody is wearing a rainbow lanyard or has a trans sticker in the book, I automatically assume that they are at least an ally. So therefore, coming out to them with my sexual orientation or gender identity isn't as scary as somebody who doesn't have that. So there are those verbal and non-verbal cues that you can see. Okay. I think it's really important, uh, Linda, as well, is that training is essential when it comes to overcoming that fear for anybody who's engaging with somebody from the LGBT community. It's something that I see uh, often when I'm doing training with police officers, is there's that fear, the fear of asking the question, the fear of offending. It is better to ask than, than assume. Don't make assumptions. Um, and again, it's about um, encouraging people to have that confidence. Like Amanda said, name, date, you know, date of birth, address, postcode. You know, it should roll off the tongue. But there is there is fear out there, and that's why training is so essential to give people the awareness in regards to when they're dealing with somebody who is very vulnerable, especially for those within the police service of Northern Ireland. You could be the first police officer that they have ever spoken to, and you may be the last. So it's really important that that first impression, and again, like Amanda said, sometimes it doesn't need to be verbal. It can just be a simple lanyard or a pin or a pen, or even the fact that you're you're conscious and you ask that question can can break down a whole a whole stack of barriers that that, that may be in existence there. Okay, no, I appreciate that. That, that actually was my main point and I think you're right in, in relation to the training and training gives people confidence you know in, in terms of you're talking about even giving the individual who is potentially the victim of a crime confidence I, th I think that the police officers need the confidence to know that they're saying the right thing and that they're not going to cause offence or you know and that, that's really important for all of us to be perfectly honest but, but it, you're right it is important for those officers to know that they're saying the right thing and, and we're giving them the and, and that 
It's a confidence. And that's why we, we've advocated quite, quite, quite heavily with the PSNI in terms of reporting all Section 75, but also with them engaging with us directly in terms of that training. Uh, and we're also working with them in terms of the domestic abuse legislation at the moment, specifically looking at LGBT issues. Uh, so looking at those barriers, talking about pronouns uh, and, and trying to tackle some of the assumptions that are out there when it comes to the stereotype for uh, domestic abuse. I appreciate that. Listen, thank you. That that is actually because your your presentations have been very fulsome, and, and I know that you're generally supportive, and, and your submissions you're generally supportive of of the the bill. So, uh, listen, I really, really appreciate it, Chair. Just before you move on to the next person, if I can suggest that we write to the policing board, I know certainly when I was on it, one of the ongoing issues was around um, the recording of Section seventy five groups. Can we just ask for an update as a committee in relation to that? so that we can um, look at it in relation specifically to this piece of legislation, but obviously of also to the domestic abuse and other pieces of legislation that will be coming before us. Okay. Yeah, we'll take a note of that, Linda. Um, thank, thank you. you. Um, Rachel Wood. Sorry, yeah. Rachel, I think you're on mute. Oh, I haven't done that today. First time for everything. Sorry about that. Um, thank you very much for your presentations and thank you again for all your work as well for supporting LGBTQ people in Northern Ireland and their families. Um, and I appreciate um, a lot of your submissions and your discussion today on legislation and being adaptable and guidance and so on. And you discussed about technology and the use of technology. And I have friends who've been through very similar issues where they've been stopped via technology by an ex-partner and only finding out through different apps and location services. So it is um, certainly know what you're talking about and your client's experience, Amanda, is, is chilling. You know, it's it, it certainly it, it happens and it's it, it's not it's not nice for anybody whenever you figure out what's been going on. So I suppose I want to pick up um, where Linda did as well and uh, your points on data and statistics and the gathering of that and on um, the publication of Section 75 or desegregated data. And you may remember during the domestic abuse bill, I brought an amendment on this um, on Section 75 and um, on A and B, which it didn't get the support then. I appreciate um, the reasons for that. But I just want to really touch on your submissions and I think it was all three of you had mentioned the need for statistics and also on the project that's already been worked on with the PSNI in terms of Section 75 reporting. So I just would like a wee bit more detail on that. If you can, give me it. If you can't, that's no problem. Um, but mostly, if you have any reflections, are victims feeling okay about this? Are they, bit, you know, when I asked about sensitive information, do you see any merit in collecting that data? I think I know the answer to that. But you know, and the intention of it being shown. And um, do you feel that anybody that would be working with that project with PSNI is being profiled? Because I know that was that was a reason that was brought up during the domestic abuse bill about not having Section 75 data. I appreciate their barriers and their issues to overcome, but I think we can overcome them. Um, and I think it's really important that we do see who's reporting um, domestic abuse, but also in, in this case, in stalking. And that we do collect, and, and you know, we might not have to publish it if there's lum numbers are low, you know, for uh, identifying reasons and GDPR and so on. But I, I think there are more walls been put up than we need to, and I think they can certainly do come down. So I just appreciate some information on that. Thank you. We we haven't got an update, uh, Rachel, in regards to the project on the PSNI uh, gathering of Section seventy five. We know that it's ongoing work at the moment, uh, and that they're working with with external partners. It's a, it's a big piece of work uh, for them internally to, to to look at. We do know that um, you know we have worked with them in terms of referrals for those who would identify as LGBTQ that they are being signposted to. to uh, organisations were were appropriate. Uh, again, in the most serious of cases or crisis, you know, situations that they're still going to those larger mainstream organisations. So it may be of a, a lower nature in terms of domestic abuse. Um, that the, the support is is there. Um, so whilst we haven't got an update, we're, we're pleased that the work is continuing. Uh, we're pleased to say that both Amanda and I were contacted by by the police 
in terms of working specifically on that new package of training for the domestic abuse legislation coming through. Uh, so we're working in partnership with them uh, to develop that, and that will be available for all police uh, across across the, the service uh, to access. Um, so that, that is currently in, in process as we speak. Uh, Amanda and I have been squirreling away doing different word documents and voicemails and different things like that. So um, we're looking forward to the, 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 the publication of that. Uh, but certainly, we're, you know, they're looking at the dashboard. They're looking at, you know, making sure that people are asking those appropriate questions and that people are being signposted to appropriate support. So whilst it's not going to be a quick fix, there is things ongoing at the moment. Um, so, as far as collecting the data, absolutely it's important. Um, how can we provide services for people when we don't know how many people we're providing services for? Um, and I'm going to say this again, I am the only funded domestic and sexual violence worker um, for the LGBT sector right across the region. Ashley works along with me at, on top of her own job. But I'm the only one funded. Um, it's a three-year fund funding project, and it runs out in December. So if my grant making organisation do not refund me, we will lose a project, and we will lose all the good work that has been done. So yes, collecting data on um, LGBT people um, who experience domestic sexual violence, abuse, stalking, all goes towards us being able to go back and say, these are how many people who are experiencing this, we don't have enough services in place to provide adequate support for these people. And that's how that's how we, you know, we're going to give adequate support to, to victims in the LGBTQ plus community. If we don't get the, the research and the numbers, then we, we can't do that. Um, so absolutely, Rachel, in answer to your question, we absolutely do think that, that data collection in that is imperative. And can I just add in as well, it's important for, in identifying cold spots too. Um, so are there people who aren't reporting, you know, is there a zero return for particular groups? And that's not just LGBT people, but are there particular racial backgrounds that aren't using the services? Um, so it's all section 75. Obviously, our interest is, is sexual orientation and gender identity, but um, we need the we need the legislation to work for everyone. Thank you, Danielle. No, thank you for that. And I suppose just it's just to try and overcome those um, concerns that a lot of people have. And we talked, you know, earlier on about the fear of asking questions. You know, without you don't want and people don't want to be offending anybody or asking inappropriate questions, so on. But if if you were so like that example earlier on, name, address, telephone number, date of birth, gender identity, sexual orientation, there wouldn't be a feeling of being profiled. <laughs> Just would, would that be something? I mean, I can't. You obviously can't speak for every single person, but that's not. Is that going to be something that would be a problem? We don't see it that it would be a problem, Rachel. Um, you know. I think more people um, would be more concerned about giving their age off, age out than they would about their sexual orientation, gender identity. Obviously, I'm not speaking for everybody here. There will be people who um, have not ever um, disclosed their sexual orientation or gender identity to anybody, and they may or may not disclose when they're asked. Um, and we'll always have a hidden number. Um, <laughs> In, in that and that's to be expected but that's going to happen in every um part of life not just you know with crimes against you so you know there will there i i don't see it that for those who are out you know and obviously there are different degrees of coming out and being out you know um for somebody like me that's completely out and, you know I don't mind what people think of me or what they have to say about me, but there are other people who are only out to friends or only out to family, but not out of work. It may become maybe more of a problem. But as you say, uh, as we say, we've said, um, if you put it out, like any other question, date of birth, address, sexual orientation, it, um, I think it's the language and the, the confidence of the person asking the question 
that is more of the problem and all three organisations, that's Car Friend, here and I in the Rainbow Project do sexual orientation training where we go through language and the appropriate use of language so if anybody would like to sign up for that we'd gladly take you on. Thank you very much, that's me Chair, thank you for your answers. Thanks Rachel, Gemma Dolan. Thanks, Chair, and thanks to you for the um, presentation and submissions. Ashling, in your submission, I think it was Ashling, you, know, um, you raised concerns around the existing services that work with perpetrators and the programmes. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. only targeted towards men. There's no gender, um, mixed gender groups. Um, yeah. Can you give examples? Um, or give more detail about these services and programs, and um, because a lot, a, a lot of yeah, a lot of the focus, Gemma, is and quite rightly so, is targeted towards women, and women being the victim and men being the perpetrator. So we're seeing uh, services and packages that are designed specifically for that, and quite narrow in their scope as well. So you may have uh, women who are lesbian who are being targeted by their partner, um, and when they've gone to access services services it's it's more steered towards men and and men's issues and men's anger uh, and that they're very gender binary in that sense that it's a, a men's only kind of space so a female perpetrator wouldn't really fit into that and there may not be a service that's available for them um, there's also the issue in terms of uh, when we've had people who are same-sex contacting some of the mainstream services and, and it's a case that Amanda brought to my attention where they've talked about the perpetrator uh, but the call handler has constantly used male pronouns. What's his name? What did he do to you? You know, and then when she said no repeatedly, I'm, I'm lesbian, my, par my partner is female, the call handler actually said, well, I don't know what to do with you which is just so, so shocking. But you know that's why we're talking about having, working in conjunction with LGBT communities, coming to do training, coming to do awareness and creating Facebook services for those who are experiencing uh, that, that element of abuse. Um, so having very, very specific and very narrow, uh, you know, gender binary programs, often people are falling through the cracks in that and not seeing themselves reflected in that support or accessing uh, those appropriate services, whether they're a victim or, or a perpetrator. No, actually, I completely agree with you. Um, but no, my question was more, and excuse my ignorance, I wasn't aware of the programmes that exist for perpetrators. Um, so I'm just wondering, Chair, if would we be able to write to the department and ask if there's services or programmes out there to work with perpetrators? Sure. We're, we're, we're taking a note of all the kind of issues that people are raising and I'll, I'll pick up on that once we finish this presentation, but yes, we'll add that to the list. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks, Ashley, for your response. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you, Gemma. Um, Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Chair, and thanks um, to Amanda, Ashley and Danielle. Um, I suppose I was, like others, trying to square that circle between the, the pace for want to capture data and then the part of the sensitivities about the question and Amanda, you, you very eloquently referred to the hidden number and I think that 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 was a you know this is as I suppose as succinct an answer as we could hope for but I still do wonder if there's more could be done because like you say this could be the you know a person presenting themselves as being the victim of stalking I can only imagine how stressful that would be. So when I try to put myself into the shoes of that person, and I take your point, Amanda, where you, you know, you routinely go down through the questions and there's a comfortableness in the person who's asking the question, that, that creates an environment where there's also a comfortableness, hopefully, for the person answering it. But that might be the moment where that person, for good reason, isn't ready or doesn't want to come out and I think there has to be somewhere in the system, maybe it's at the end, at the outcome of the system, where there's an exit pace, where the trust has been gained and somebody can leave a final register. 
of their, um, you know, how they identify. Because I think to just always have a hidden number is not necessarily a, a, just an acceptable place for us to land on this. But I appreciate why there is. So I just, it's just really food for thought, I suppose. And something else you said, Ashley, is um, food for thought. It's the relationship piece between the victim and the perpetrator. So understanding that from the victim's perspective, there is no relationship. Mm -hmm. And the perpetrator, whoever they may be, perceives or believes or wishes that there is. And that's regardless of how you identify and gender issues at all. But I think that's something we're going to have to be very clear about in the legislation, because there is a danger if we don't understand that clarity that this could fall under other pieces of legislation as opposed to stalking. So I genuinely thank you uh, for your presentations. They've been very thorough. And thank you to the three of you. Thanks. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Sinead. Well, if there's nobody else, then can I um, thank you all for taking the time to spend with the committee. It's very much appreciated. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks now. Take care. Okay. Um, okay, members. So, in terms of all of those uh, different evidence sessions, there were a range of issues that have been highlighted um, by members. And what we'll do is um, pull together a summary of all of those, uh, both raised in the written and the oral uh, evidence sessions. And Gemma had raised some issues last week too. So we will pull them together and write to the department and the other um, bodies that people um, spoke of and uh, we will be able to then pick that up whenever we get the responses to it. And once we have the department's response um, to these issues then we'll make the arrangements for officials to attend uh, in order to give oral evidence and then members will be able to raise any questions and discuss issues with those officials. So we will write to the policing board that Linda had suggested in respect to an update on the Section 75 issue and also the multi-agency project and that Susie Lampa Trust both offered to provide further information during our evidence sessions and we'll follow up on those as well. Okay, so if members are content then with that approach, we can proceed. Okay, thank you. Um, item 8 then on the agenda is the Protection from Stalking Bill. It's just a report from the Assembly Examiner of Statutory Rules. The Committee agreed to refer um, that bill uh, to the Examiner of the Rules and to request a report highlighting any delegated powers um, to which she would draw attention to. So in particular the Committee requested views on whether it's appropriate for each of the powers to be left to subordinate legislation rather than including them in the bill itself and whether the uh, choice of assembly procedure for each is the most appropriate. So the examiner has now provided that report to the committee, indicated that she is satisfied that the delegation of legislative powers in the bill is appropriate, and the exercise of these powers is, in each case, subject to the appropriate assembly scrutiny procedures. The examiner did draw attention to clause 17 of the bill, provided, which provides the department must issue guidance to the chief constable, about the exercise of the Chief Constable's functions under the provisions of the Bill relating to the stocking protection orders for interim stocking protection orders and may from time to time revise the guidance and must arrange for any guidance to be published in such a manner as the Department considers appropriate. So the examiner notes that the exercise of this power to issue guidance is not subject to an Assembly scrutiny procedure. However, in the Delegated Powers Memorandum, the Department states that the guidance will be laid in the Northern Ireland Assembly for information purposes. So the examiner has suggested that the committee may wish to consider whether it be more desirable to place upon the face of the bill a requirement uh, to lay the guidance um, before the Assembly. So if members are agreed, we will refer the suggestion from the examiner for statutory rules to the Department of Justice for a response, um, following which the committee could then give further consideration to the matter. I personally would be minded to go with what the examiner for statutory rules has suggested, but if we can get a response from the OJ, then we can look again at that particular issue if members are content. I agree. OK, 
Okay, thank you. Item eight. The uh, or, or nine. Apologies. Updated proposals for the oral evidence sessions on the damages return investment bill um, is is in the pack today following discussions at our meeting last week. And the proposals include two sessions with organisations representing insurance companies, businesses and insurance lawyers, two sessions with organisations representing solicitors and others that act on behalf of injured plaintiffs, the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries and four organisations representing the health and social care sector and various views from the medical profession including GPs and the Medical Defence Union which has experience of the effect of changes to the rate in England and Wales and is currently in discussions with the Department of Health about potential policy interventions that could mitigate the direct implications of a change in the rate. So it's um, members if we are content in terms of scheduling these proposed oral evidence sessions unless there's any further um, removal to the list. Linda Dillon. Not to all age here, I still think it's a lot, but um, I mean, if that's what, what we're doing, that's what we're doing. I, I just think the point needs to be made to all of those who present to the committee that we will not be able to discuss the rate. We are not setting the rate. We will have no part or place or anything to do with setting the rate. So if they're coming to present to us, they need to understand that what they're coming to present to us on is the framework. And that's what we'll be, that's what we'll be taking evidence on, not on the actual rate itself. And I think that that should be, that point needs to be made clear to those coming to present to us before they come, because it's unfair if they maybe aren't fully aware that that's the case. Now, I, I know probably many of them will be, but if they're not, it's unfair to have them come and making points to the, the committee and, and to be perfectly frank, wasting their time and ours um, to making points that, that we really have no influence over. I do think it's important that we hear different views. I think it's important that we, we set the right framework, but we need to be very clear with them. When they come to us, the evidence they're given needs to specifically be around the framework and the, the policy going forward, not around the actual rate itself. We have no influence on that. No, I think that's a, a fair point and, and one that is well made and um, we'll make sure that that is articulated to the groups that uh, that is what the discussion has to be about. Um, okay, well then, members, once those evidence sessions have been completed, then the committee will be able to consider if it needs any more. I, I suspect that will be in, in the negative in terms of that, but nevertheless, um, we will go about scheduling then the, these oral evidence sessions to assist in uh, deliberating around the bill, and that'll be updated in the forward uh, work program for the committee, which um, we will discuss later in the agenda. Okay, so the next item is item 10, um, pages 64 to 71 of the meeting. Um, uh, the committee considered the statutory rule which amended the personal injury discount rate that is required to be taken into account by courts in determining the amount of damages payable for future financial loss in personal injury cases to the minus 1.75%. And at last week's meeting, we agreed that we had no objection to the rule, subject to the views of the examiner of statutory rules on the technical aspects of that rule. So the examiner's report is available and has indicated there's no issues in respect of the technical elements to the rule. So members are just asked to note um, the report from the examiner for statutory rules. Members are content. Okay. Agenda item 11. At our meeting on the 10th of September, the committee considered a proposal for a statutory rule to add universal credit to the list of benefits from which deductions may be made for the payment of fines and other financial penalties under Part 1 of the Justice Act 2016 and agreed to ask the Department for further information in a number of areas. Following consideration of the further information provided on the legislative safeguards in place regarding the level of deductions that can be taken, the criteria used to evidence hardship and how the addition of universal credit to the list of benefits from which payments can be taken will be communicated to applicants and the advice sector. The committee agreed at the meeting on the 8th of October that it was content with the proposed statutory rule, uh, which is subject to the draft affirmative process and is cross-cutting as the Department for Communities needs to make corresponding regulations to enable it to make the deductions. 
The Department has now advised that the order was paused pending the outcome of two judicial review applications brought against the Department of Work and Pensions challenging the universal credit deductions on several grounds. Some of these had potential implications for the Department for a Community's approach to deductions in general and the approach to fine default deductions from universal credit in particular. Judgment in the judicial review cases has now issued and the court found against uh, the Department for Work and Pensions on one ground um, that will not arise in relation to the Northern Ireland regulations. So the Department has confirmed that there therefore is no change to the policy content of the statutory rule since the Committee's approval of it in October 2020. So members are just asked to note the reasons for the delay in laying the rule and also that um, unless there's any further information or clarity that is needed, the Committee will then formally consider the statutory rule once the report from the examiner of statutory rules is available. So that's just by way of an update for members, which we will then come to in due course. Okay, members. Uh, agenda. Sorry. Yes. Sorry. 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 Sinead. Um, could I just ask the report um, on the statutory rule? There will be an impact assessment, no doubt on that. But I just it would be nice to have on record the, um, I suppose, the piece around, you know, safeguarding individuals and particularly those who are really living on very low income thresholds. That you know that the minimum income is guaranteed and all. I, I know it is, but I think it would be good to have that in writing somewhere, just that safeguarding piece um, for poverty. Thank you. Yeah, and, and, and that's fine. Um, th th this was all considered by the committee previously, so obviously with a passage of time. Um, but uh, in terms of all of that, that th there'll be no issue around that. But this, this was talked about, I think, back in October, whenever we were looking at things as well. Item 12 then on the agenda is the um, DOJ budget. The department has provided an update in respect of its 21-22 main estimates and a variance explanation relating to the February forecast outturn. It has also provided an update in relation to its response to the 21-22 public expenditure COVID-19 exercise commissioned by the Department of Finance. As well as bids for spending areas, this includes a cross-justice recovery bid of 16.2 million resource and 245,000 pounds of capital to increase capacity in the system in a coordinated way to support and speed up recovery. 13.2 uh, million of the 16.2 million is for legal aid cost, but there's no information on what accounts for the remaining 3 million. So if members are content, we will request further information from the department on what other areas are included in the COVID-19 cross justice recovery um, bid. The, the Committee for Finance has also uh, written regarding accruing resources, uh, increased granularity, uh, which shows accruing resources for the Department of Justice of almost 52 million for the 2020-21 year. Some of the accrued resources are self-explanatory, but others less so. For example, £4.5 million for work done for other departments and ND, NDPBs, but no detail on what that work was. So if members are content, we'll forward this paper to the Department of Justice and ask for more detailed information in its accruing resources for the 2021 year. So members, if um, you're content, we will action that unless there's any more information or clarity that is needed. Okay, thank you. The draft modern slavery human trafficking strategy, the department um, officials attended the committee meeting on the 11th of March, outlined the results of the consultation on the draft modern slavery strategy and proposed next steps, following which the committee agreed to request an updated version of the strategy, highlighting the changes that the department has made following consultation and a range of additional information, including the potential for the justice minister to work with executive colleagues to address immigration and asylum issues for victims of modern slavery and human trafficking. An update on the potential impact of the UK's exit from the European Union on this issue and how department plans to engage with victims and survivors. The department has now provided the updated draft strategy and the additional information requested by the committee. The additional text in the draft strategy provides more detail on the strategic context in which the response to modern slavery 
and trafficking is delivered and provides more information on the arrangements for supporting victims and the overlaps with immigration and asylum issues. So if members are content, we will uh, note the 21-22 Modern Slavery Strategy. Unless there is any more clarity that is needed, we will duly note it. Okay, thank you. Agenda item 14 then. At the meeting on the 22nd of October, the committee noted information provided by the Department on a proposed private family law early resolution action plan which had been developed in conjunction with the Department of Health and aims to improve outcomes for children and families by diverting parental uh, disputes which do not require judicial adjudication away from court and supporting the early resolution of parental disputes which do, which do come before the courts. The committee subsequently um, considered an update from the Department at the meeting on the 15th of April in which it indicated the intention to now publish the plan and progress initial actions. The committee agreed to request a range of additional information, including clarification of any changes made since the draft plan had been considered in October, the reasons for the delay in publishing the plan, a list of key stakeholders who have been involved in the development of the plan, further information on the actions that fall to the Department of Justice, for which no information on progress or timescales had been provided, and when further information on the financial implications would be available. So the Department has provided the information that was requested which includes confirmation that no material changes were made to the draft action plan between October and April and highlights that further details of timescales for some actions have now been added in response to the uh, committee's comments. So members, if we're content now to note the proposed private family law early resolution action plan, um, we will duly note it unless there's any further points of clarity that's needed. We will note it. Okay. Thank you. The Department has indicated that we'll engage further with the Committee um, as work on the substantive actions such as the pilot information sessions and mediation pilot does progress and they will provide uh, updated information as that happens. Agenda item 15 then is the Committee Forward Work Programme. The Department has provided a list of items of business that it would like the Committee to consider at the meetings in June and also at the meeting on the 1st of July. It has also indicated that the Justice Bill is now unlikely to be introduced to the Assembly on the 24th or 5th of May. Therefore, the briefing on the principles of the Bill that it had requested on the 3rd of June will need to be deferred to later in the month. So, members, that will free up a slot for um, Bill evidence sessions on that date, which we're currently uh, trying to arrange. Um, there is also a list of oral evidence sessions that the Committee had agreed to schedule before summer recess. There are paragraph 3 of the Clerk's Memo. And further consideration does need to be given to the timing of oral evidence session with Judge Marinan on his review of hate crime legislation. Now that the Department has written, listed a uh, written briefing paper on its response to the review for the meeting on the 24th of uh, June. Um, Mike Nesbitt has also written to me in respect of the um, Director of Public Prosecutions uh, being invited to come to the committee to discuss a letter from him to the Chief Constable in respect of the PSNI making public its recommendation for prosecution in respect of the Bobby Story funeral and other recent actions and decisions to the PPS and that correspondence is in the uh, table to pack with a copy of a letter from the Minister of Justice dated 14th of May regarding her written ministerial statement on Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary. Um, into this issue. So the statement and the report were circulated to members on Monday and are at pages 29 and 112 of the table pack. So members will be aware that the committee has already agreed to schedule a session with the Director of Public Prosecution and uh, he has indicated availability for the meeting on the Thursday the 17th of June. The department has also requested to schedule an oral evidence session on the summary of responses to the consultation on proposals for reform of rehabilitation of offender period and proposed way forward uh, on that date. So members, in terms of some of the duration of these meetings, it will be helpful to know that the Health Committee has agreed to use the new virtual channel to broadcast its meeting on Thursday the 17th of May, Thursday the 10th of June and Thursday the 24th of June. That there provides an opportunity for um, the Justice Committee to hold all-day meetings uh, with a break for lunch in the Senate chamber on those dates, uh, or we can start the meeting earlier, um, which would be at 12 noon, 12.30 or 1 p.m., depending on what suits members. So if all-day meetings are not held on those dates, the meetings um, will need to run then later if we're going to be meeting 
at 12 noon or 1 o'clock. That will take us into the, the later evening if members um, have a preference for doing that rather than starting in the morning and breaking for lunch and trying to, to complete it in the afternoon. So we can discuss this in, in due course. But if members are content, first of all, we'll schedule the session with the Public Prosecution uh, Director on the 17th of June. And then I would be keen to get feedback from members on their views of holding all-day meetings from the morning time or a preference for um, a 12 noon uh, start with later meetings in the evening. So I will take feedback on that suggestion. Anyone wants to start? Or has anyone any objection to, start to doing all-day meetings in the morning, if, if I can stimulate the conversation? Chair, yeah, just maybe open up just to get the conversation going. I, I suppose, um, I know that one of the things, if it's not committee days, a lot of us uh, try and attend APGs or constituency work and that. But that said, you know, I'm just so aware of the volume of work that we have to do. And this is legislation, so it has to, it does have to take precedent um, in terms of a lot of other things in the diary. Um, and I was thankful today to be able to attend an APG um, on animal welfare only because they had moved it to one o'clock and not two o'clock. Um, but I I have to be uh, totally honest going forward. I, I recognise that um, my priority has to be on, on the legislation that's in front of us. And I know that is going to um, compromise my attendance to a lot of APGs and there may be other ways I can keep abreast of what's happening in there. But I'm happy to to go with the earlier start if that's uh, viable to others who maybe are sitting on other committees, which is less easy, I suppose, to, to take themselves away from. But I'm happy to go with the earlier starts. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Linda. Sorry, Chair. You're okay. Um, I suppose I'm more concerned about the the level of paperwork that might be coming at us and being able to get through that before uh, a meeting which is an early start on a Thursday um, and I'm, I just don't want to say that I can do it because I can't do it unless unless I've, I've read the paperwork and I don't want to come to meetings not prepared. I don't want to come to meetings not having um, read what is going to be discussed at those meetings and I'm wondering, is there some stuff that we're doing in committee meetings that could be done in an informal committee setting or as a as another meeting set aside? And I do think we do need to prioritise the legislation over and above everything else. Um, and that, that's not to, to demote anything else that is of importance, but I do think that the legislation has to be prioritised. So are there is there anything that we can look at that could be done because uh, I'm not suggesting for one minute that we ignore anything that's the first thing I want to say I think anything that has been suggested nobody in the committee has said no we shouldn't do that or we should drop that if that is a suggestion coming forward fair enough um, but are, the, are there things that we could do in an informal committee setting or that we could do as a, a sort of a set aside meeting on a a lunchtime on a Tuesday, for example, which we have done before. Um, I think the, the the problem with the informal, there's nothing there that I can see, you know, unless we're going to put Judge Marinan into an informal setting or the Lord Chief Justice or the Director of the PPS, and I don't think we're going to do that. And then the other sessions to do with legislation has to be held in a formal public um, session. Uh, similarly, some of the, the briefings from the Department for Justice aren't suitable for informal meetings either. They need to be part of the formal committee meeting. So um, my view is that there isn't anything uh, on the, the forward work programme that can be done informally. Then you've just the logistics. Sometimes there's more work involved in actually setting aside a Tuesday and trying to organise that as opposed to trying to just put it through all in the one day. But the point's well made that for an early morning, uh, an earlier morning start, um, members will need to, to have the paperwork in advance of that um, to allow you to, to have the, the preparatory work done and coming to it. So I think that point's well made. And I think if we can do something around that, although I'm, I'm very, very conscious that 
it's all very well us sitting and making arrangements and how we can do things. There are staff in the background that have logistical challenges as well. So I would appreciate maybe if we were able to leave it with them to, to see what can be done in terms of getting even some paperwork because obviously weekends, maybe if you were getting something earlier and you were able to, to work on that over the weekend, it's Mondays and Tuesdays are out for the biggest part, you know, depending on what's on in the chamber. Um, and again, that does depend on what's on in the chamber. I'm saying they're out, but very often you could, you could be reading a lot of your paperwork in the chamber. But I've seen days where I couldn't, I don't have time to, to stop to take a drink of water. Yeah. Um, never mind read papers. So I'm, I'm just flagging it up. And I think maybe if they're, I do want to consider the staff as well in relation to this issue. Okay, well, let, let me just ask Christine if she wants to, to comment on some of the conversation. Yeah, I mean, I think the issue with the papers is there's deadlines for us to get the papers. We don't always we, we don't get them in time to pick yeah. them up for the weekend. I mean, the, the, there's time scales that are set, and the department, I have to say, have been very good at getting us papers, but it's just there's no guarantee from week to week. Um, the papers for next week's meeting will be due in today. Um, we normally will get them, but we're in committee, so we're not going to even start looking at them until tomorrow, and it would then result in us trying to put out two packs um, which is the same problem if we run the Tuesday meetings, which we can look at if you prefer to do the written papers. I suppose our aim would still be to get the pack out on the Monday, which is our deadline to get it out, regardless if it's a longer meeting, um, because largely it's to accommodate the oral evidence sessions on the bill and the, all the written submissions are already there. Um, for the bill sessions um, and once we can get the summary there was a summary of a doubt in the table pack today it was, it, was the up, it was just updated from last week if we can get the summary of evidence done and out then you have all the papers for those evidence sessions anyway um, and it's really the written papers are, are which you would you're going to have to look at anyway but I mean if you prefer we can look um, I'm just looking I don't think we can get Tuesdays it wouldn't be every week but we could possibly no. get a Tuesday meeting but at lunchtime. To be fair, Christine, listening to what you said, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to push that. M maybe, maybe a compromise chair on the Thursday, starting earlier, would be that we start at eleven, which just gives us an opportunity on a Thursday morning to to sort of pull together in terms of ourselves as as members of the committee to discuss then before we go into the committee, if you were content with that, and that that's maybe a better way of moving forward rather than starting to put pressure on, on staff. And I know that I'm also conscious, even given what, what has been outlined by Sinead, that people do have APGs and, and things on Tuesdays at lunchtime as well. So is that maybe a better compromise? If members would Start at 11 rather than 10? Or uh, even if members would be agreeable that we will look from week to week and start it at whatever time we feel we need to to get through the evidence sessions. For example, on the 27th next week, we may not need to start it until 12 because we're still trying to assess the availability of a lot of the witnesses for the damages bill. So we may well not need, to, for example, maybe to start it until 12, depending how many sessions we can get stacked. So if you would be agreeable, we can assess from a week to week basis on yeah. sort of time and not go any I don't I mean not go any sorry Christine. If others are happy enough, I'm happy enough to, to change to eleven to try and accommodate um if, if other committee members are, are content with that rather than to, I, I don't really want to mess you about and you haven't a you have enough on your plate to be fair, I think and I, I'm content that we could start at eleven. And that then allows us, and I mean, if we're finished a bit earlier some days, then I don't think anybody will complain. <laughs> okay. Ra Rachel, you had your hand up on that. Um, do you want to just come in with your thoughts? Yeah, no worries. No much of has already been said. Just I'm happy either way, really, but just more concerned about getting, you know, if there's paperwork and stuff that needs to be issued, you know, is pressures on staff getting that. and. You know, waiting on deadlines and, and so on. So, you know, I, I like Linda, I don't like coming to meetings not being prepared. And, you know, even when you get table packed, you're rushing to, to do it just to make sure that you're trying to be over it anyway. But 
Um, I don't think there's anything on our forward work program that would do informally. I think most things have been, you know, removed or have already been done informally. So um, I'm happy to do a marathon Thursday. Like it'll just have to be done. So just that whatever is whatever suits and, and is more manageable for staff really. Um, just to highlight it is for the three meetings where health are moving to virtual so it's not for every meeting it's, it's every time we're in the senate chamber they've agreed to do that so it's every other meeting um the other thing to say is the table pack will go out on a wednesday by tea time rather than thursday morning so um that will go out hopefully a bit earlier it won't go out just before the meeting on thursday morning anyway Okay, and I know we always try and minimise what's in the table pack in any event. Um, so, members, for those three occasions, then uh, we'll go with the eleven o'clock for for the meeting whenever we're able to do that. I think that is, is prudent to do it because I know members are keen to to keep on uh, these items that we we've scheduled in. Um, so, if if we're content, then we will organise it on that basis. Um, we'll include what the department have asked in terms of the oral evidence session on the 17th of June. Um, I think it would be prudent that we put the oral evidence session with Judge Maranin on his review um, once we have received the department's written briefing in respect of the, the department's response to it. That will take it now to, to the end of June for that session with Judge Maranin, but that does seem to make sense that we would know what the department's position is on that report before we would meet with um, Judge Maranin and, and we'll schedule then his session on that basis. So the clerk will update the forward work programme taking into account um, these changes. Um, okay, members also in terms of consideration there was a proposal from the Deputy Chair to hold a meeting with the Oireachtas Justice Committee to discuss issues of mutual interests and are, uh, and are of the view that given the, the heavy programme that we have taken us into the summer uh, recess that we look at trying to schedule um, such a meeting um, in the September period when we come back um, because I don't think that's going to be possible in June but l let's try and make preliminary arrangements for some period around the, the end of September time, start of October um, and then hopefully the rules will allow a face-to-face -face, um, meeting on that rather than doing it by Zoom. I certainly would be keen to do that whether that's here in, in Parliament buildings or, or in Dublin wherever we can work out the best place for that to take place and if we went for the end of September, October, I think we have a better chance of being able to to do that in that manner. Yeah, thank you Chair. Okay. Cor correspondence, there's three items just of correspondence, I'll just draw attention to one of those. Um, there's a response from the Department um, in respect of the Committee's request for information on the planned actions to implement the outstanding recommendations highlighted in the Sajini report of the follow-up review on the implementation of recommendations in the thematic inspection of the handling of sexual violence and abuse cases by criminal justice system. Um, and also then, members, there's an updated correspondence cover sheet um, in relation to this item of correspondence as the incorrect letter from the committee was attached to this response in the meeting pack and as a result the proposed action has changed from the department has provided a table setting out the actions being taken in relation to each outstanding recommendation and included proposed time frames where possible. So if members are content, we'll request an update on progress in six months time, unless there's any more clarity needed on that particular item. If not, then if we are content to action the remaining items of correspondence as set out in the cover sheet, unless members wish to comment on them, we're content. I have no chairman's business. Is there any other business? If there's no other business, then the next meeting of the committee will take place on Thursday the 27th of May um, and it will be in the Senate uh, Chamber at Parliament Buildings. Is that one of those dates for 11 o'clock, Christine? Yeah. Okay, so that meeting will be at 11 o'clock on next Thursday in the Senate Chamber or via the Starleaf facility. Okay, members, thank you for your attendance today. That's much appreciated. Take care. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly.